today. Uh, Carla Batiste, she's in the studio there, uh, producing, done a fantastic job as well. Matt, I usually call 30 seconds thought, and there you are, I can time it so well. Finley Knowles, uh, Mazik Lavantel is back with us. Hooray, hooray, hooray. And Parekh Birmingham, all a brilliant. And I, I absolutely can't finish without thinking you. Uh, thanking you, our, our viewers and our listeners. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I will be back Saturday and Sunday. But in the meantime, have an absolutely wonderful from me. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. They're now trying to say, hey, we've got a really clever idea for the cost of living crisis. Right. Eat cereal for dinner. But for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a cow. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. April and May, two wonderful months to be watching all the sport when it comes together for things like the football and the rugby and other winter sports. They come to a climax at the same time as cricket gets underway as it has done this week in the county championship and some records and extraordinary moments. And we'll be reflecting that with Neil Burns and Angus Fraser in the last hour of the show. We'll also be talking to Tony Jardine about all the Formula One and you can add to that as well the very latest looking ahead to the masters next week as well in the first hour tonight we'll be looking at manchester united against liverpool sheffield united against chelsea and keith and mark our referees and in the middle hour tonight yet again the premier league don't quite know what to do if some of those that they think are the well to do in the premier league have broken one or two of the rules they're now thinking of a, a tax instead of a points deduction. Why would that be? Because one of the top sides is going to get into trouble any minute now? Or what is it? Anyway, delighted to say that Gavin McGall will be with us. Andrew Mills will be with us. Gavin Buckland for Everton, the statistician. And um, a very special guest tonight. In fact, he's the youngest ever Premier League director. Uh, he's a businessman in his own right. Jack Sullivan at the age of 24. Uh, became the one of the top men uh, within West Ham United. Of course, uh, his father, David Sullivan, has uh, really flown the flag for West Ham, whether you like it or not, over many great years. So really looking forward to Jack being part of our middle hour tonight. And of course, if you're not staying in with us for the whole night, but there's stuff that you want to hear about the golf and everything else, you know what to do. Back of the stand, podcast out tomorrow morning. Would love you to hear it live. It's all just a little more dramatic. Well, let's start then, shall we, with what drama there was once more today between Liverpool and Manchester United, this time at Old Trafford, of course. It finished two apiece. I'm really surprised it did in many ways. Liverpool looked to be in total control. Manchester United looked to have stolen it with a second goal that was just um, a, a fantastic bit of opportunism and vision. Uh, to be fair, from Fernandes. Uh, but then Liverpool fought their way back into it and the intensity with which they played in the last 10 minutes, I don't know how they didn't win it. But they didn't and the points were shared. And who does that benefit? Well, if you know any Arsenal supporters, they will be shouting at you tonight because it benefits them probably better than any of the other sides and they remain top on points from Liverpool and a point ahead of Manchester City after the weekend. Let's get involved then, shall we, um, with what was a terrific game as far as I was concerned. Today, Pete Molyneux, the Manchester United supporter for over 60 years, has seen it all before, but it was something uh, different again in some ways. Not quite as good as the Wayne Rooney overhead had, uh, shin kick for me or one or two of the other goals. Beckham, you may remember when he scored his goal from the halfway line against Wimbledon, but it was pretty special. And Leroy Phillips, the Liverpool podcaster. Uh, gentlemen, very good evening to both of you. Good evening, Mark. Yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, as a, a neutral today, the pace at which Liverpool finished that match today, actually, Leroy, in the last 15 minutes, they sort of went off it a little bit and allowed Manchester United eventually back into a game that I thought they were never going to get a foothold in. As you can see from my my, my, my body language, I'm really, really, really annoyed. Um, points thrown away today. Done exactly the same thing we done in the FA Cup game against United. Um, the pass back from, from um, the youngster there is just too casual. United are nowhere at the races at that point. Bruno scores that goal crowd get in the game all of a sudden it becomes a bit more frantic um really 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 annoyed like you know um i i, I can't even put it into words um i want to see a shake-up though i want to see some changes um for our next game in the prem um i want to see sabba sly out i want to see maybe curtis starting maybe even harvey elliott um i think he deserves his place we were controlling that game too complacent. That's what happens when you don't take your chances. It will come back to bite you. 
Well, uh, that's a, a pretty good frustrating summing up from a Liverpool <laughs> fan, I have to say, and, and good on you for coming out with all of that. Um, Pete, for you, of course, it's uh, a little bit of uh, the old guard at the back with Maguire, then this young man up front who scored a, a goal that looked as if it could have been the winner, Emmanuel, and he's a, he, he's a, he's a thoroughbred Englishman as well, and he's the future. Yeah, I'm not quite as frustrated as Leroy, um, <laughs> <laughs> because twice now, two home games on their own, one in the cup against Liverpool and one in the league, we've kind of got out of jail from sinking in the middle. We've kind of disappeared, our confidence hemorrhaged away. But each time we fought back, and again, we did it this afternoon when at half time, I think a lot of United fans in that stadium were thinking, how are we going to land a punch on Liverpool? Crowd had gone quiet and they were, I won't say dominating the match, but it had in control. But then, yeah, it can turn, well, it can turn on sixpence, can't it? And Bruno's goal proved that. Um, not just pulling it back to one all, but the way it lifted the crowd um, and it lifted the team. Maguire was inspirational again. Um, but we just stopped doing it often enough or long enough within games. But sadly for Liverpool, Leroy, we seem to be, have done well against you this season. Um, <laughs> whereas teams like Palace, Brentford, Fulham have come to Old Trafford and, um, and done us. It's crazy. Yeah. The world's upside down. Well, <laughs> yeah, it, it is in some ways at the moment, in, in many ways too. I don't know what Man Manchester United nearly really have to feel about this season that... Um, I don't know how how does the new management, if I can put it that way, sort this out? Do you let the manager continue his development? Is he going to get it right? You're not going to win anything this season, or is it the right thing to move on? I'm I don't like that. You keep moving on, and you never get anywhere. You're back to starting again. Yeah, I mean, we, we can still win something this season, Mark. We'll take we'll take the FA Cup gladly. Yeah. You know, we're not we're not that arrogant. Um, we'd no, be no. honoured to win win the FA Cup. But you're right; it's fits and starts within games and, and through the season. The season's almost a write-off by our, by our standards. What we expect in terms of the quality of football, the United style, the daring do, um, is only there in patches. Fortunately, it's in enough patches to get, keep us high up in the league and, and get through the cup games. But as regards the manager, yeah, he's got to have at least three years, I think, Mark, especially mm. from where we came from. In May 22, that was the United team at the lowest confidence I've known he, since relegation in 74. So we had mm. a lot of building to do. He obviously had to get some players out of that club who didn't have the right attitude. He's done most of that, I think. Um, it's what he does in the summer that counts. I think the new management above him have got to, well, talk through with him his plans and see if they believe in him or not. And, um, you know, we talk about faith in football. Faith is about believing things will happen, even though there's often no evidence that they will happen. I'd stick with him, and I think United will be back sooner than perhaps we all think, and maybe some people hope. Yeah, I think so. And, I mean, you know, that great Manchester United uh, youth set-up is going to bring one or two others through here. You... We want everything so instantly these days, don't we? And 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 that perhaps is is the problem. I mean, I you know when I first was able to cover for Sky, as it was in those very very early days under Sir Alex Ferguson when you train, trained at the Cliff, you know, the class of '92 hadn't even been named that by this stage, and yet here was uh, Sir Alex for what he'd already done. He'd got this group, and he knew exactly when to make a move for all of them together. Yeah, yes, he did, and that's great judgment. It's very similar to what Busby did, even though it's before my time. Mm. It took both those great managers, the two greatest managers United have had, seven years to win the league title. Mm. So um, there is an old saying that you can't plant seeds at night and pick flowers the next morning. And that's very true when it comes to quality youth players coming through. It's a really tough league, the top of English football. Um, and we've got some good players. I think they will come through. And that's why he's got some older players around him. As have Liverpool got some very, yeah. very good young young players. But you can't rush them. No. It's going to be interesting now, though, Leroy, isn't it? Because we know that this is uh, a Jürgen's last season. We know exactly that he'd love to go out with a Premier League trophy, whether that happens or not. You know, he, he, he's, he's, he's managed to get them across the line in the uh, Premier League uh, at least once now. 
is what Liverpool are going to do next. This is a fascinating side as well. That Liverpool have got to get this right too. Yeah, you see, obviously, we're building. We've we've started that from the top. Obviously, we've getting Edwards back in, um, and we've got we've got other guys filling in. The problem is uh, once now is getting the coach. Once we get the coach on on board, because obviously, um, the problem is with Klopp. He's when he leaves, everyone's leaving. So from the the youth team setup and everything else, the management that he's got in there, whoever comes in, they've got to be ready for this. So I I I'm nervous. I'm scared what's to come because whoever comes in after Klopp it's massive 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 boots to fill so yeah I mean it's all good and well having the youth but when managers when coaches come in these days there's not much time no one gives you time mm. so they're a bit it's a, they're, they'll be reluctant to use the youth that's what I'm thinking um, one thing I did want to say though about the United which, which I was watching their game when they played Chelsea mm. And what worried me was the fact that because of the manner in which they lost, I knew this game was always going to be a tricky one because they're at home. It's against the old, the old enemy. It was never going to be easy. But it's just right. if only we took our chances, man. <laughs> God, with some sat I'm so frustrated. I can't help it. Like you know, I just, I, I there was a part of me that didn't even want to do this today. But you know, it has to be done. Honestly, oh man. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it's quite interesting, actually, um, with all of this for me, Pete, is that everything these days is instant. Everything through social media happens basically either at the time or straight away afterwards. The comments are there. The, the interaction is so swift, but then forgotten about and moved on. And for me, I still believe if you want to be a side even in a league that I don't think can be dominated quite in the way it has done in the past. But if you want to be in that top four or five and competing for everything every year and being in Europe, you need to know that you don't have to instantly get everything right because it doesn't work like that. Whether we've got everything else in the world happening overnight, football doesn't work like that. No, no, it doesn't because they are people at the end of the day and people don't work like that. Uh, life isn't like that. What? What? I, I don't think it would be a great world if if it did get. You could get instant success. It's great. Success is great when you fought to achieve it. Um, and it, also, I mentioned Busby and Fergie, but in recent times, it took Klopp a couple of years to get the recipe right at <clears> Liverpool. Yeah. Guardiola didn't just walk into City and instantly. He struggled to get them to a Champions League final and win it. So, um, no, it, it's credit to the other teams. Uh, we shouldn't take them for granted. They. They, they want to have a pop at Liverpool and Arsenal and, and City and United because uh, they're the big clubs. Yeah. So what you need is management that will uh, uh, take on board what you've just said there, Matt, that you don't blow about like uh, washing in a gale. You're like a rock in the gale and you stick to your guns, you pick the right people and they, then you have faith in them. You give them time, you give them resources and they, you either get success or you then make a change. But you, you don't need jerk, otherwise you're all over the place. And if you ask 10 football supporters for their best England team, you'd get 11 answers. Uh, you exactly would. And I'm still not quite sure whether... I don't think it's down to the footballers we got. It's the way that I think the Gareth Southgate's got to play them and motivate them. It's a tournament. You only get one chance. You've got to have a, a right go in the right way right from the very start for me. So we'll wait and see what happens with that one. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I, I, Leroy, I don't know whether you ever were, were old enough to see um, the Wimbledon side under Joe yeah. Kinnear. Um, you will have been, of course, Pete, and sadly in the last few minutes, um, the news has just been released that oh, the wow. former Spurs defender and, Wim and Wimbledon manager Joe Kinnear has died at the age of 77. His family have announced in a statement. If you ever w wanted to find how dressing rooms coming together could manage things that you never believed possible, Joe Kinnear's Wimbledon, Bobby Gould as well, was very much part of that as manager. But those guys really sorted everything out with a chairman who was slightly different as well in those days, <laughs> uh, Pete, Sam Hamam. Very, yeah. very, very much so, yeah. They, well, they were characters, weren't they, for sure. Very sad news, that, Mark. Yeah. Obviously, I've only just heard it. I guess it's only just breaking. I, I remember him as a very good foot, uh, fullback for Tottenham. Yeah. Uh, Kinnear and Knowles were, were excellent fullbacks for Spurs <clears throat> in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, 
But a man that loved his football but always had a smile on his face is, is, is how I remember Joe Kinnear just off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. Uh, can, gentlemen, can I just, uh, yeah, sorry, of course can I just can. come in there? Sorry. It's just, uh, I just wanted to say um, my sister's been, um, she's in the, been in hospital for the last four weeks and I said I'd be on here tonight and I'd, 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 I'd give her a little big up. So, Shirley, get better soon. Yeah. Shirley, you are, from all of us here at the Sunday Night Club, get better soon. Thank you very much. Indeed, guys. I'll tell you my Joe Kinnear story and we'll get reaction from those that really knew him, uh, hopefully as the show goes on tonight. Joe Kinnear, the great Wimbledon manager and terrific Tottenham defender, uh, Joe Kinnear, has died at the age of 77. You're listening to Talk TV and watching Talk TV. And soon it'll just be talk, but we'll still be here for you, the fans. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, a very good evening to you. Sad news, as always, when you hear about a great player and manager in this country uh, has passed. And today, Joe Kinnear, at the uh, age of 77, the former uh, Irish uh, football manager, uh, of course, as well, with uh, um, many, many great moments with them, but also as a player with Spurs, that he won the FA Cup, the League Cup twice, the Charity Shield, and much more besides, and of course, um, a manager of uh, real intent, particularly at Wimbledon, although he'll be remembered too at Newcastle United and Nottingham Forest, amongst others. One little story I'm going to just tell you about Joe Kinnear. I met him on many occasions, and uh, on this occasion it was uh, 
England against Ireland. Terry Venables was manager of England, and uh, it was the game where they had all the trouble. And uh, it would have been a very difficult evening for everybody, a game that was abandoned at Landale, Lansdowne Road because of the crowd trouble after 20 minutes, and Jack Charlton was furious with everything, and Terry Venables didn't believe what had happened, and recreational violence was uh, a, a real problem at that stage. But after an evening of working really hard, uh, Mike Parry, who uh, used to be, of course, a, a doyen of talk sport, was then the press officer for the England football team. And um, we'd got everything we possibly could do. Joe Kinnear and Vinnie Jones walked into the bar uh, towards the end of the night, both of them in dicky bows and dress suits, and on their way out, they came over and said hello to all of us. And then off they went uh, into the night, only to arrive back as fresh as daisies after a night on the town and the casinos and everything else at uh, 8.30 the next morning. And Vinnie Jones and Joe Kinnear over breakfast made us laugh out loud. Hard-bitten journalists laughing out loud at what was quite a difficult time. We all knew how difficult it was. But here you could see this connection between these two greats, one of whom is a film star, of course, these days, and uh, Joe, who was always a great football man. And uh, it was just one of those moments you'll never forget. And what had happened was, earlier in the evening, is that uh, with Mike Parry, uh, the little worse for wear, he'd fallen off the back of the sofa and uh, found himself sleeping um, behind this sofa as Vinnie Jones sat very close to one of the journalists and we had the great story of Vinnie Jones bit my nose um, which made us all laugh and uh, was very much part of the whole occasion it's quite extraordinary really and Joe Kinnear took it all as he did a football match you win some you lose some Kevin Boris is the AFC Wimbledon podcaster. Kevin, good evening to you. Hi, Mark. Um, oh, Joe. Just great company, you know. He was great. I interviewed him, I think, four times. I think twice for goal, once for 442, and once for a newspaper. And he was great. He would, he'd give you 20 minutes, and you'd end up two or three hours later. The drinks would be brought out, stories would be brought out. I think, I'm, I'm sure, I didn't know at the time, I think he managed Nepal as well. He did, he was in it. He, I think that might well have been one of his first managerial positions. Yeah, because remember him, I'm, I'm quite a pedant, and it's, he didn't like this, but he said that he had a flat, when he, when he went to Nepal, he had a flat overlooking Mount Everest, and I said, it's unlikely he was overlooking it. And <laughs> he, he didn't find that very funny, and just <laughs> tore into me, called me every name under the sun. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be thrown out. And the next thing, he, he, he brought me, he made, made me a cup of tea. I said, right, what are we talking about? <laughs> I just thought I'd really upset him, and I hadn't at all. Um, mm. It's amazing, as, as, a, as a manager, he just epitomised everything we wanted from a manager. Dave ba we obviously had Dave Bassett and then Bobby Gould. Yeah. And then we kind of went a bit wrong. Ray Harford was next. Never mm. got the impression Ray Harford was going to stay around for very long. No. And then the great Peter Withs disaster of the 91-92 season. Yes. Um, and then when Joe Joe came in, obviously being assistant manager, it just seemed like it was the, the perfect appointment. And I think with that that heart attack he had in '99, I think he would have stayed even longer. And it was just he had the heart attack. I think it was the early part of March '99, and we didn't we only won one the left next sort of 14 or 15 games, um, and it was largely down to him. I think he was just such an influential person, an influential character, not just his coaching and his ability, but just the person. Mm. I think everyone missed him and then it just it just didn't work after that and it was such no. a shame and then we went to the Norwegians came in after that yeah. and it was such a pivotal moment you know all of history. those man all of the managers and Sam Haman the, the chairman and everything and the crazy gang as we talk about there was yeah. you, you know there was a there was a bit of humor but it was full on as well at times wasn't it yeah absolutely yeah no he, Joe was very funny his stories are hilarious I mean <laughs> not being a bit no one found Joe Kinnear's stories more funny than Joe Kinnear himself. Because <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't tell half of them because they're laughing. He, he must have told them thousands of times. <laughs> but yeah, I think that humour and that, and that as, a, as a fan base, we just took to him um, incredibly. I mean, there's, there's obviously the, the Spurs connection. I think, mm. did he play? I think he played in the 71 72 yeah. 
Well, there cup. was him. There was Nice One Cyril, if you remember, which was Cyril Knowles, and the song yeah. was all about Nice One Cyril, Nice One Son. And then Joe Kinnear was the other full back, wasn't he? But he was he was quality. I mean, he was no nonsense. They were no nonsense in those days. Yeah, and I remember one of the stories he told me was how he broke his leg and then he finished his career. And it's it not one of the worst leg breaks you could ever imagine. He just comes and shrugged it off and said, that's what it was like in the 70s. He yeah. just, you had a bad injury, you finished playing. And he got into coaching almost by default, I believe. It wasn't something he planned to mm. do. But I, but I think footballers in those days, when they, when they finished early, ended up having a news agent or a shop. I remember Ron yeah. Harris, you know, the old news pub. Agency. Or a pub, yeah. It's a pub or a news agent. That's one of what they ended up doing. Yeah. But obviously nowadays, it's completely different. And yeah. they, they go into the and they've got enough money. Mm. But he was one of those one of those managers that just kind of just was a football person. Yeah. And you can't imagine him doing anything else. The fact that he went on to manage at Forest and I think at Luton as well. Yeah. And Newcastle. was just We just loved him. I think it was just great. Every time we played against him, you kind of, you know. <laughs> Is it odd, odd, odd feeling? Is this yeah, one I mean, of those? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I remember so well about so many of those characters that you you, you talk about there. Um, my side of the game, broadcasting, was very different in those days in many ways. Of course, they knew we we needed stories or you needed interviews or whatever, but there wasn't there wasn't this great machine now of three hundred no. cameras and everybody from around the world wanting to ask this, that, and the other. It was very much um, the number ones or their assistants from the newspapers and very few of, of us who were uh, doing Sky and perhaps there'd always be a football focus and there, and there might be uh, a, a regional ITV or whatever. But it was, it was much more relaxed and you, you got to know them. And they always, people like Joe Kinnear also, away from just the gags, might have told you one or two things about... <laughs> If you if you're covering the game, just just be a little easy on so and so. His family yes. not having a good time at the moment, and you respected that, and yep. they respected you when they knew that you weren't going to just go off and give a red top a story that would have ruined your career. And we yeah, were very much broadcasters at that stage. There was a lot of us, and I worked with a lot of greats when I was at the BBC as well, and and learnt from them. And but you learnt from managers, and you learnt about what it was like to be a footballer and you learn why they didn't go back and play football in the afternoon like we all wanted them to, you know, to practice yeah. more having missed an open goal. Fascinating insight. And uh, once they trusted you, um, you had the best seats in the house, of course. And Joe Kinnear said one thing to me. He wasn't the only person, but he did say one thing to me. He said, he said, Mark, never forget, he said that you're working alongside multimillionaires that will have riches I mean, this was very much sort of later on. He said, they have riches, and he was summarising and stuff, that um, you, you could never dream of in your job. But what you have to remember is that you're a millionaire in your job for the seat that you sit in and the action you see and the people you meet. And I yeah. think that's just perfect joking here. Yeah, I, I, I said, I think, I think I'm trying to be in Fort and maybe, maybe in five. When you're with him in his office, and he and it said he made me a cup of tea. Nobody else, anybody else, to do that. He brought two cups of tea. And we sat and, and he, he, there was whiskey as well. But I didn't didn't have that. Yeah. I was driving. However, he, when you're with him, you didn't. I know he was the manager of the team I supported and was obviously writing about. Yeah. But you didn't feel that he was on a different level as a person. I can't imagine now sitting with Pep Guardiola and him bringing me a cup of tea and you're having a chat about stuff. He talked about football, but he talked about other things as well, about cars and about Vinnie Jones trying to sell me a TV that day. And he, I don't know where he got them from, but he was trying to sell TVs to people. Yeah. You got, imagine that John Stone's trying to sell you a, you know, a pair of shoes. It's just, this just doesn't happen. Yeah. That's, that's a completely different level of level of yeah. people Wait. and a different level, level of life that it, it shouldn't be because they're just human beings doing a better, doing a more interesting job than I've got. Yeah. But, I just don't. I think those, he was one of the last managers he to was. be like. And and he understood. He understood when he took over that the crazy gang and everything that had happened. And we're going to be speaking to Bobby Gould at eight o'clock here tonight right. uh, on on the show about the life and times of Joe Kinnear. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the former Wimbledon uh, manager and the uh, former 
Spurs defender who it's been announced today by his family has died at the age of 77. Uh, we're going to celebrate his life because it, it has been a great life. I remember on one occasion that he was um, supposed, he, he, he couldn't make it. He was going to turn up to do um, uh, the Sunday, well, it wasn't a Sunday night show. It was a, I used to do a weekly show on uh, Sky uh, where we'd have sports line at 7.30 till 8 and then a later one, 10.30 till 11. And we used to get big guests on that show. And Vinnie Jones came along in the end with his agent. But he said, Joe will absolutely love this, Mark, if you get this right. Let's have you, me and the agent in camera the whole time, but neither of us will speak to the agent because it's supposed to have been Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and we did it. I mean, we just had a bit of fun between ourselves, you know, thinking, and the agent sat there for nearly a quarter of an hour in the second half of the show, and I never spoke to him and neither did Vinny. And it was, uh, that could only happen with Wimbledon. Yeah, I think we were a different club then. I think the you can't you can't outdo you. It's impossible to run yeah. a Premier League football club like Wimbledon was run. It yeah. just didn't. It just couldn't happen now. No. In so in so I know obviously as fans of other clubs would know us our our club from the crazy game stuff and the antics yeah. on the pitch, but the stuff off the pitch just couldn't happen. No. In in two thousand twenty four, when you upset someone by mm. saying the wrong word very easily. That didn't happen in those days. You, you, new players would have their shoes, their, their expensive shoes, cut up, and their and their clothes cut up, and they'd have to drive home in, in a borrowed tracksuit top and their pants. And they might have come from Southampton or Birmingham. They'd drive, and, and it was just what you did in those days. And you, if you didn't like it, and I, remember, I interviewed Ian Holloway a couple of years ago, a few years ago now. He did not like all that kind of stuff, and he mm. just didn't take to it found it really hard and he admits now that he just wasn't ready for it yeah. and he knew about it but he thought oh, they'll, they'll leave me alone they did not leave him alone at all yeah. so it's a strong character but you had to be a very strong character to be part of Joe Kinnear's team part of his his part of his backroom staff and if you as a, were a journalist and there weren't a Wimbledon supporter they, you, they made it really really difficult for you I, I, I saw I won't me mention I saw a then quite well known uh, broadsheet journalist who had interviewed Chris Perry, I think it was Chris Perry, Dean Blackwell, and they picked him up and they threw him fully clothed into a into the into Beverly Brook, which is the, not a person. Beverly Brook was a was a stream <laughs> that ran through the old training ground, fully clothed. But he was mic'd up as well because he was doing a, a live broadcast. Threw him fully clothed into a pond, into into a, into a stream. Brilliant. Imagine doing that now. Yeah, this I, is, I, Kevin, Joe, Joe, I know. Great. It was fantastic. Thank and and Kevin, thank you for your memories as well uh, of uh, the great late Joe Kinnear. It's been announced by his family that he has died at the age of seventy-seven. Bobby Gould uh, will be with us at uh, eight o'clock tonight to uh, ha with his own memories. It would be great to speak to Gouldy as well about Joe Kinnear. Then um, we've had the, the football's been on late tonight hasn't it as well all the way through and uh, we're going to cover as much as we can with all of that we've got a big hour coming up as well in eight just do remember that uh, if you are, are leaving us now or you've only just joined us and you've missed some things we have a podcast back of the stand that'll be out tomorrow morning and uh, you can get that wherever you get your podcasts from uh, back of the stand um, and uh, well worth a listen if i say so myself Right, well, Sheffield United against Chelsea is all over. Um, uh, who's, who have we still got with us now uh, in the next... Uh, it's David uh, uh, Chidgy. It's David Chidgy who's with us, uh, the uh, Chelsea fan caster. Uh, sorry, David, um, you, you know, news there about Joe Kinnear and uh, your game going on. Um, how, did, how did it finish in the end? Oh, Mark. <laughs> I think it was payback for what happened on Thursday night, uh, where we obviously, you know, won the game with two goals in the last minute, and and Sheffield United did what did the same to us that we did to Man United. But uh, I mean, it, I think the only word I can really use to describe the performance was pathetic. I mean, when it comes to a game, this lot can't manage their way out of a paper bag. I mean, it was just ridiculous. Poor in the first half, uh, Sheffield United much the better side. We played a lot, a lot better in the second half, uh, went 2 1 up, and should have managed the game out or scored mm. a third or a fourth, but aren't capable of it. And that's what happens. And w with all of that in mind, before uh, Johnny joins us uh, as well to put his side of the, the story with this, 
is for me what what is it i mean to both of these clubs i mean manchester united have been doing this for a while but chelsea really in the wilderness as far as uh, they have been for so long well we've we've been off it for i mean certainly the the, the two seasons since the clear lake took over but arguably if you go back to the previous winter before the sanctions uh we we weren't in particular good form then but it it certainly really tailed off uh, over the last season and a half I, I mean, this is what happens if you if you go and replace pretty much an entire experienced squad with with young, unproven talent, uh, very little leadership in the side. This is what happens. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm afraid they're kind of reaping what they've sown. I mean, you know, maybe in a couple of years' time, there'll be a decent side again. But it's it's hard to take when you're a supporter of a club that's won pretty much everything for the last twenty years. So, mm. oh, I- good. Uh, I, I completely uh, get where you're coming from. Johnny uh, Gascoigne from the Shore on View uh, joins us right now. Good evening to you as well, Johnny. Evening. How you doing? Well, we're doing well. And it, it, do you know what? You could have won that game, though. We, we should have won it at the end, I think, because I don't think that were a foul in a million years in the last few seconds of the game. But it's one of those where you, you go one all, you think we're pushing. We, we could really, we could do something. We could take this. We could sneak it, and then you could see one down. It's like, oh, same old story, same old story. But one thing we have noticed over these last two games is, if we keep pushing, we can get something. And it's been shown today what happens when we don't throw it away, when we don't switch off, when we do see games out. And it's not a win. Uh, it's not three points. It's not something that's going to climb us off the bottom of the table. But point at home against Chelsea when you rock bottom of the table, I'll take it all day long. I've still got shakes. <laughs> yeah, I mean. It- you know, it's a, that's it, isn't it? You've got to enjoy what it is now and where you are. Yeah. And what, what, are, what are the fans' thoughts really now for you this season? And what, and what, what are you going to do? Uh, I don't think everybody's as romantic about it as I am. Uh, I don't think anybody else is thinking that we could possibly sneak staying up. I think we, we're kind of an acceptance of it, really. Hmm. But until that R's next to his name, I'm not getting up on us. And uh, I think there's a few, a few, I say a few, like me. Not, not that many. <laughs> But we'll we'll still be there. We'll still sell out away ends. We'll still keep going to uh, Bramall Lane, packing out, getting behind the lads, because that that's what we're there for. If we were yeah. here for glory, that, I mean, ground would be empty every game. Yeah, look, I'm completely with you on all of that. Um, I mean, I, I I can't believe, but I've got to say this now because I should have said it a little earlier. But the events have passed us by. Being a Cambridge United fan, I just love it that Peterborough United have managed to win the EFL trophy today at Wembley. 2-1 eventually. They were 1-0 up with nothing to go. And then Dale Taylor equalised and uh, Burrows with his second of the game won it for Peterborough. I mean, I, I live about seven miles from Peterborough and I, you know, I like to wear my Cambridge United bobble hat when I'm walking the dog. But um, <laughs> in all, in all uh, uh, right stuff, you know, for the, the fans were brilliant on the way down today. I was on the train with a lot of them. They were having a good crack. They really enjoyed it. This EFL Cup which doesn't mean anything to the bigger sides, but even to the Sheffield Uniteds and everything, Peterborough themselves, they've been up and down. They've still got the possibilities of getting back into the championship. Let's not forget that football league football, if it's your team, what you're watching is still as important as playing Manchester United. Exactly. I I think too many uh, social media fans out there they only concentrate on like the big six teams and they don't really go to games. They don't understand it behind it. They, they, don't get me wrong, every football fan deserves to follow whoever they want to. I'm not going to judge anybody for it. But don't judge us for enjoying our moments because we don't get many of them. No, you're right. And David, the other thing is, I mean, under Roman Abramovich, um, whatever we think, uh, with Bruce Buck, who um, I always thought steered a very clever ship as the chair, uh, Ron Gourlay, who went on to do other things, obviously. But... Uh, you had great success and and again a bit like Manchester United you know it's all very well inviting in these people who've got money but they they don't have the soul do they of football yeah I mean it's 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 really it's really interesting listening to not just Johnny but you talking about clubs like Peterborough United and Cambridge and it would be very very easy to say oh you know the Yanks have come in they're chucking money all over the place or even go back to Roman when when he did that as well but I I actually think the soul started to go at the beginning of the Premier League I think that that's when the Mm. the, the trouble started I mean um, look at the number of fixtures that get moved to a Monday night or we were playing on Thursday night at 8.15 there's absolutely 
In fact, actually, I'd go so far as to say that, you know, match-going supporters are treated with utter contempt by the clubs and the Premier League and the broadcasters. And, you know, as I said, I've got a lot of time, you know, I'm a man of a certain age, so mm. I've got a lot of time for the lower league clubs because, you know, the the, the, the great thing about, about football in this country is the py pyramid. Yes. You know, if you remember the, the, the protests about the European Super League a few years back that, of course, Chelsea were very involved in and the supporters were in getting it stopped, that's why, because we recognise how important the pyramid is. That's what makes this football, or football in this country, I think the greatest in the world. I think that is uh, a, a perfect thing to say and uh, a perfect way for us to um, finish this little chat. Johnny, David, I haven't given you so much time tonight, but you'll be back again, I know, before the end of the season. Thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us tonight. I did just uh, want to also say, if you're just joining us here, Joe Kinnear, uh, has died at the age of 77, his family announced today. Uh, this is what they've said in detail now, just to read it to you. Of course, uh, not just the Wimbledon manager, a great footballer uh, himself, uh, an international manager with Ireland and uh, played in uh, a really great Spurs side and won all sorts of cups and competitions at right back with Cyril Knowles uh, across the way at lefty. So we're sad to announce that Joe passed away peacefully this afternoon, surrounded by his family. Joe was 77, had been suffering from dementia having been diagnosed back in 2015. He'll be remembered fondly by many, both as a player and a manager. His Wimbledon team finishing sixth in the 93-94 Premier League was a phenomenal achievement. It really was. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Well, a little later on the show uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at the uh, cricket season, which has got underway with some extraordinary scores as uh, well and individual efforts. And Neil Burns uh, is uh, with us to talk all about that and uh, Angus as well uh, later on. And uh, in that last hour too, we'll be looking at the Masters next week. And we'll also be talking to Tony Jardine about all the Formula One. In the second hour, uh, we're hoping that Bobby Gould will join us, uh, somebody, of course, who would have played at exactly the same time and is exactly the same age as the late Joe Kinnear, who has died today at the age of 77. So we will hopefully hear from uh, Bobby before we got in to get into our chat. And we'll be talking to a very young director tonight, Jack Sullivan of West Ham United, along with uh, uh, lots of other guests. And we're looking at uh, just where the Premier League is going with its financial fair play or not. Before that, though, uh, let's uh, say a very good evening to our referees, Keith uh, Hackett and uh, Mark Halsey. Gentlemen, very good evening to you. Good evening, Mark. Austin, you know, you're here. We can hear you. We can hear you, Mark. We haven't lost you. Can you hear us? Do you know what, Keith? Uh, the, the great thing about Mark is he, he, he knows how to play the whistle, but he never gets that computer right, does he? I know. He, he relies on his better heart all the time. <laughs> um, did, did you... Was jo uh, He's back now. Mark's, hey, Mark's hey, back. Hey, thanks. Good, yeah. good to see you back. Where have you been sunning yourself? Where were you last no, week? I've just, I, I spent the last week up in uh, the northeast, um, the old uh, father's side of the family uh, st stomping ground, and a little bit further up um, in the wonderful county of Northumberland. And up oh, at, wonderful. Up at Bamborough and Sea Houses yeah. and oh, uh, lovely. Ah, all around there, just for a, a little bit of air. Good weather we got, too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, oh, uh, <laughs> what, what was the... And, lovely, and, lovely in Spain, Sags. <laughs> uh, oh, of course it is, yeah, but it doesn't have the feel <laughs> that it has up there. Um, Joe Kinnear, of course, who refereed him? Uh, yeah, as a player, um, did you... Well, I, 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 I oh, came yeah. across him fairly regularly when he was manager of both Wimbledon yeah. and uh, Newcastle United. Yeah? He was a character. Um, but he was... Um, I, I used to make reference on his Joe because he would praise you when it was appropriate and at the same time he would be critical if he was unhappy about a decision. But he was happy to chat. He was happy to talk football, a proper football man, and... My condolences to his friends and family. You know, at Wimbledon, they used to turn up in the coach because it wasn't their ground. They were hiring Crystal Palace. And, um, you know, I can remember on one occasion them going into panic because they'd forgotten the stockings. <laughs> and uh, and and uh, so they were having to rely on uh, getting in touch with the Crystal Palace uh, kit man to, to borrow a set. Yeah. Those sort of things, I'm sure, don't happen now, but uh, they were all in panic. They were all in panic. Yeah. Uh, Mark, what about you and the memories of Joe? Yeah, this, I mean, obviously, before my time on the football pitch, um, but obviously watching him on TV and man manages, managing his teams, obviously, he was larger than life, wasn't he? He was, uh, he was a character, and he was, he was much loved by everyone, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, and, as I say, condolences to his friends and family. Uh, football has lost a, a, a wonderful person. Yeah. Mm. And and again, another sadly another footballer with dementia uh, for the last yeah. few years as well, and uh, um, you know real feelings and thoughts uh, with the family uh, tonight, and uh, lovely for both of you to uh, ha have your say as well at the the start of this part of the show. Mm. Uh, you know, still what, what are we going to VAR? Is it VAR <laughs> said? Oh. Um. Well, you know what. Oh. Um, I, just, I, just, I just give up. I give up. I do. I give up. I give what, up. Well, Wolverhampton would be one point I'd like to mention to start yeah, with. Yeah. Well, give me your I mean, verdict on that disallowed goal. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly unhappy that they chalked that goal off. Uh, they're looking at the law and they're interpreting the law as they see fit, and they're manipulating the law. A few weeks ago, we had the Burnley player impeded. Unable to get to the ball, the goalkeeper, um, and they allowed the goal to stand. Mm -hmm. On this occasion, the goalkeeper's got the ability to move. The forward is in an offside position, but he's about a metre in front of the goalkeeper. So the goalkeeper has got the opportunity to, to, to maintain contact visually with the ball and to move to the right. He did neither. And so as a consequence, 
they then found an excuse to to choke a, a good goal off, and and for me yeah. that's yeah. that was a wrong decision. Yeah. I, listen, I, I, I agree with Keith. Um, you know, being in an offside position itself, it is not an offence in, in itself. OK, now, you know me, Sags, I've been a goalkeeper at non-league level for many, many years. Mm. And that Wolves player did not interfere in the line of vision um, of Fabianski. If that, if, that, if that player was five or six yards out, Fabianski still wouldn't have saved that, that, that ball yeah. because it was headed, headed at pace, very wide, and not one player complained about the Wolves player being in an offside position. I'm sure if that had been on the other foot, David Moyes would have gone absolutely ballistic. Now, OK, people saying it's a subjective decision. Fine, OK. So then why has VAR got involved? They should have stuck with the on-field yeah. decision and, 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 and the goal's given. Mm. Um, listen, Gary O'Neill's absolutely spot on to be furious because for me... That is a good goal. Fabianski is never saving that. He's got the ability to move. He can see the ball. He doesn't even move because the ball's the header's at pace. And even if he, he, he you know, it's, it's past him before he can make before he can move. I think so my, I, my I, I, concern. I'm just astounded. Yeah. I'm, I'm astounded. It was disallowed. I, I you know, it, it's about you know the fans, the players, the managers. Um, and entertainment, and we want to see goals. We don't want to see goals chalked off in that manner. I mean, Howell's got to get a grip. He's got to get a grip of his of his people. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, I, don't I, have I, to apologise. I've got full confidence in him. I've yeah. got full confidence in him. Don't, don't apologise. You know, go on. And then say, the, 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 you've got concerns. You've got concerns, Keith, haven't you? Well, I've got concerns on the basis that there is an inconsistency of application of the laws of the game. Uh, you know, it's easy to get all these referees in a room, as I used to, Mark will tell you, and we would have a discussion around decisions and incidents, and then we'd have a uniform approach. But what we've got is, you know, until we move to a specialist panel of VAR operators, because we know they're not going to dump VAR, but if, yeah. if football is happy... The participants, the owners of clubs, the, the managers and players and the fans with VAR, I'm a Dutchman. I mean, the, 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 the truth is that we're all unhappy with it because of the inconsistency. And we're searching for ways to rule goals it, out when they should yeah. be allowed. Well, I, I, for me, and it's something that both of you have talked about in detail over the, the months during this season now, the goal line technology works. We know there is yeah. a way that we could make uh, the offside work electronically. Yeah. That's all we need. That's yeah. all we need. Yeah. Nothing more. Yeah. Let no, no. the man in the middle and his assistants yeah. and the fourth official deal with everything else. And yeah. I haven't counted up how many bad mistakes have been made. But of course, with VAR, these mistakes are made at the critical times in the game. They have ruined yeah. so yeah. many yeah. Premier League yeah. matches this season. Yeah. Do you know, Mark, uh, today... One at a time, one at a time, one at a time. If everybody yeah. in football is saying that's a good goal yesterday and the PGML are saying, are giving a, putting out a statement saying why it wasn't given and it was correct, then there's something wrong, isn't there? Yeah. There's something drastically wrong. Yeah, Keith. Yeah. With the PGML and, and, yeah. and uh, IFAB. Keith. Yeah, I think that there's no question that they've got to do something about VAR, Mark. It's not working. We've said it times many. You know, I watched a referee today, uh, Anthony Taylor. He, he's in charge of the biggest game, perhaps, of the season. Uh, and he refereed really well. Yeah. You know, for some unknown reason, the last couple of weeks, he's kept his hands out of his pocket, producing yellow cards. Mm -hmm. The yellow cards that he issued today were in correcting law, they were, they, were, they were used at the right time, and he managed the players, and he earned the respect of the players. It can be done. And I, I just think that they're in a mess. They're in a complete mess, and Howard's got to get a grip. You know, for me, I'm, I'm quite clear. There's a guy sat in our group now, Mark Elsey. He should be there yeah. working with Howard, Howard should use his skill sets. Yeah. Or pick the phone up and chat to him. What, you know, and... what, what I would like to see is what I used to see with Richard Scudamore when he was chief executive of the Premier League. He 
admitted to his staff when I interviewed him at a, a, a day away at the Churchill War Rooms, and the last hour yeah. and a half was me interviewing him. The one thing that really I, I took away from that when I was asking him was that he said, I am by no means the best at anything here with the staff I have. But the best thing I've ever had is I'm not jealous of anybody in my staff being better at the thing that I've appointed them to than me. And that is yeah. what the referees have got to do. And what I think the referees have got to do, and uh, I've got 30 seconds, so it's going to be a yes or no from you. Yeah. I'd get rid of VAR. Howard Webber's got to get men like Mark in who are going to help him out. Referees have got to start refereeing again. And I don't think that fans will do anything but understand, yes, there's going to be the odd human error. Of course there is. But there is not going to be a farce that is totally ruining the top level of our football. Yes or no? One word each. Yes, I think there's no question. For the news that matters, for the opinions that matter, for the stories that matter, find me, Vanessa Feltz, every weekday at 4pm, only on talk, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> Go I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
This is Talk TV. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument. We tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. During this hour, we're going to be looking at the Premier League. We're going to be looking at whether point deductions are the way forward or whether a luxury tax is more to do with it. We also have the youngest uh, director uh, within the Premier League in Jack Sullivan, who will be talking to us uh, about many things during this next hour. Gavin McGaw will also be with us, the former man at the Football League and now with uh, Hanover and a fantastic uh, company that he's got uh, all over the world now and uh, Andrew Mills as well who's the first ever licensed agent in this country and a chief executive those guys to come very shortly um, but I like first of all just if you're joining us now um, to remember Joe Kinnear he uh, died at the age of 77 this weekend his family have announced that in a statement today and uh, it suddenly brings back memories for, for many of us who've been sitting in chairs like this and broadcasting sport and watching it for nearly three decades of footballers and certainly for me two, two generations of managers. You really got to know them as well in a very different world to the one we had here in that you became acquaintances rather than friends but certain, pe certain people that you respected, others um, that you got on with and others that now and again had to bollock you because you were out of order. But that was the way of the world and still should be that way but a lot of things were kept in-house. Joe Kinnear was a great footballer, firstly, and uh, secondly, he was a uh, terrific manager. Manager of Wimbledon, so too was Bobby Gould, a great footballer and great manager, and a contemporary of Joe Kinnear, both um, Joe at 77, and Bobby himself is 77. And Bobby, this can't be easy, so my first thoughts for you and for your family is really um, just thank you very much indeed for, for keeping it together to come and, and just say a few words to us uh, about Joe, of course, a contemporary in age with you and, you know, he used to pull on an Arsenal shirt and he used to pull on a Spurs one. Yes, Mark, it's, um, it was a great shock. Um, Marge, my wife and I were just sitting down and all of a sudden you get a phone call and... You, announces that Joe Kinnear has passed away and I just broke down, I just broke up. I, 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 I never have envisaged anything more with Joe, you know, but for, for a long period, though, he has been poorly. That has to be noticed and... Oh, I'm still shaking, I'm still shaking. I... It's something that, that, you know, once something like that of, of Joe... It, it, he was he was a comical person. He really, really was. And when I took him to Wimbledon and everything, we we had many, many fine times, you know. And it, we 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 all enjoyed being there. And uh, uh, you know, these these years just passed by so quickly. You know, mm -hmm. I, like you know, he's seventy seven, I'm seventy seven, and the, the the awful thing is, you know, I, you know. Is a is a possibility of of, of the of the brains and and and, and mm. the deaths uh, how they're ac accumulated mm. by and everything and I think now we're looking at the the, the footballs in in those days that you just mentioned the six in the sixties and the seventies mm. the, they were leather balls mm. and they absorbed the water and the amount of heading and and everything that. You know, well, yeah. for, uh, in the I, mo in the years gone by, you know, we you just think about it and you think, mm -hmm. well, you know, 
what, what were we doing? And, and when we was ahead in these heavy leather balls, they 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 held the water and they made them a, a very dangerous yeah. um, I, piece I, of leather. I I agree with everything you're saying, and of course, uh, at this stage, I always think of the Jeff Astle Foundation and the great work that his daughter Dawn has done, and I've been able to be. Um, uh, an ambassador for them at times when we've been able to bring them on to air and, and, and find and the great work that she's done over many years. But one other great thing for me about Joe Kinnear, Bobby, and, it, um, and you'll think the same, is he told stories that he laughed at and made you laugh even louder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks for thanks for doing that. You know, it, it just changed me. Uh, yeah, we we laughed and by we did laugh as well. You know, we, and we had Sam and Man and, and we had we had a no mind the players being crazy. The management weren't far behind them. I can assure you of that. And everything, yeah. all the happenings and everything else and comments and uh, and you know the, the, that's the wonderful thing of football. Mm -hmm. In in those days, we can we can look back now and say. We we had some great days and we really enjoyed that and you know and, and, and to be to be one of you know like Joe Kinnear a, a Tottenham fullback right back you know mm. and he he, he 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 did have this sense of humour there was no doubt about that oh yeah I mean he did and on many occasions the you know to the modern there are modern football people of course there are but they're they're very different these days. Um, you really felt felt a sense of belonging. I always know the players that played for you felt that, and I know that those that played for and with Joe Kinnear as well. You know, strong men that you are, emotional men that you are, but caring men. And and Joe was Joe was caring at the right times. I mean, he knew he knew when when to to be serious and when to be funny. He did. He did because. Uh... You know, I think our education is, uh, you know, like a, I, I wasn't, a, I wasn't a great um, schoolboy, but you know, I didn't get any A levels, didn't get any O levels. You know, I just, I, I got a situation where I, I, I really, we, we, we did laugh. We, we, we can sit, we, we could sit down and, you know, we could have a real good argument and and fight, mm. fight the cause and everything, and then and then then to all, all of a sudden you could break away and. And a bunch of players that you were together, or management that was together, you could just you could have a smile and and say, okay, let's learn from that for the for the future future days in in football. Uh, he'll be missed. Um, we're you're at an age as you mentioned at the start of this, and I'm sort of getting there as well now. Where we knew a different type of football. We knew when we had to keep things quiet. When we had to respect the football clubs with telling uh, things that were real and those that the club needed to keep really within the club because of the way that they looked after the players and, and everything like that, which I think has changed in a, in a very different world. But I always found every time I, I saw Joe, and of course you and I have done shows together and everything, is that Joe always remembered people who were interested in football first. Yeah, yeah, because it was his love. It it was it was his it was his future, and it, and, and the understanding and and look at the great players that he played with as well, yeah. Mark. You know, you've got to you've got to remember that, and to be a part of that Tottenham Hotspur team that that, that was was there oh, was all, all oh yeah, but they but they had great players. They had great players, and and and, and you know, I sit and I, I I sit now for hours in front of the television my, my wife Margie think uh, she'd give me a special room we call it the snug and I go and lock myself I go and lock myself in there and I, I you're watching the, the big I'm match again aren't you Bobby <laughs> you're watching the big match again I know you are we all are yeah, yeah, but but the circumstances are, you know, like I sit down and I think to myself, well, I've, they've had twenty five passes and they've not got past the halfway line yet. <laughs> yeah, that's the modern game. In in some ways, you're absolutely right with that. Just um, one final thing, and and a, and a legacy of him with uh, uh, Ireland and, and and everything else he did, and what you did, uh, and what Wimbledon did. It's very difficult to see such an achievement like that in the future? Um, it can be done. 
it can be done. Liverpool, we took we took them on. We we had the great Don Howers attached to to our mm. management, and we we all dedicated ourselves. And there's a story on the Friday afternoon before we played on on the Saturday at the training ground. There was uh, Dave Besson, the goalkeeper, and he was he was out there with Alan Cork a little Dennis Wise and they were they were playing at, at quarter to five in the afternoon playing penalties <laughs> what did we get at Wembley the next day a penalty yeah. and what did we get we got the biggest ovation for Dave Besson to be the first player to yeah. save save a penalty at Wembley in that cup final uh, yeah, and 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 and, and that, that, that I think that epitomises the prof the professionalism that we we had within an in infrastructure of Wimbledon. We got a lot of criticism, we had a lot of laughs, yeah. and Joe was part and Joe Kinnear was part of that. Lovely, Bob. Thank you very much indeed. Lots of love to Marge, and uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, with your thoughts of a colleague and real friend in Joe Kilnear, the former Tottenham defender and Wimbledon manager has died today at the age of 77. Well, this hour is an important hour for us uh, as well, uh, and it always is when Gavin McGaw and Andrew uh, Mills uh, join us, and uh, I'm hoping we're going to be able to uh, talk to uh, uh, those guys uh, in a moment or so. They'll be able to reflect what we're talking about. We've just changed one or two things, obviously, with the the news there, I'm wanting to hear from Bobby Gould about the death of uh, Joe Kinnear at the age of 77. But uh, in this first part, we're, we're, we're really looking here at where we are with what is going on with financial fair play. All of a sudden, in the middle of the week, I suddenly hear that there might not be point fines in the future. Let's try and do it another way. And I'm thinking, why do we need to do it another way? If you've already done this to the likes of Forrest and to Everton, and there could be others like Leicester City who could have problems, what is the problem? I call it taxidermy. Get stuffed. Premier League. Do the proper thing. Get the whole thing sorted properly and make sure you get your rules right and your punishments right from the very beginning. Right? What do you think about that then, uh, Gavin Buckland, um, this is ridiculous, isn't it, really? In terms of changing the rules? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I mean, mean, changing the happen. rules after they've already implemented a rule that is affecting our league this season. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, as an Everton supporter, and I suppose Nottingham Forest supporters would feel the same, yeah. you may end up being the only clubs who ever be charged on a certain set of rules in a draconian manner. Yeah. And then the subsequent rules, which they have spoken about last week, you know, they want to make the you know, the punishments less severe. The talking of just making it a fine if you if you breach initially, like Everton Forest and maybe a point deduction further down the line. So we, we could be the only clubs in theory who'll ever get a point deduction for breaching the mm. breaching the rules. In our case, Mark, and I and you well you well aware, yeah. is its expectation is our, our second commission will be you know, reporting tomorrow, and that will be tw not once in a season, but twice in a season. <laughs> and, and and we've spoken before about Evans' financial management hasn't been the best, but that would seem slightly ridiculous to me, speaking just as a football supporter, not an Evans supporter per se. Well, I think that, that you make such a good point there that what, what's been forgotten in all of this are the people that in the end are the ones that have paid the money to watch the games at the grounds, that have paid the money to watch the games on television, that have basically paid a lot of the money to have to watch adverts and things sponsored by players who are making through image rights and everything. Extraordinary yeah. amounts of money. Good luck to all of them on this. But let's not yeah. forget, at the end of the day, whatever the Americans think, whatever they think of in the Middle East, because they play there in front of nobody at the moment. In this country, we play for the fans of the football clubs, and it's lifelong in this country, and that should come first. Absolutely, and, and, I, and there's, there's an argument to say, isn't there? And I know you, you, in, in, in your strap line there, you, you've said this is, the, the thing is, and, and 
is is it fair for everybody? I mean, I've not got a pro- problem with a punishment and you know fine or or, or or a sport and sanction. The issue to me is is whether um, it's no coincidence that it's well known, isn't it, within football circles that some of the big clubs are feeling, you know, post COVID world are feeling a little bit of the heat financially, mm. and maybe a couple of them on the precipice of, of beating PSR and then getting a points deduction. And it's no coincidence that when that sort of eventuality has come, possibly comes to fruition, they're looking at getting rid of points deductions. I don't think those two things are uncoincidental. No, speaking not. as a supporter, and, and and that's where fans are. That's where fans are discriminated against, and and I think that's wrong, and that that's the issue issue for me. I've not got a problem with them changing the punishments as such. I know we've been at the points deduction. I like the idea of a fine and then further along the line down a, 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 a you know a points mm-hmm. deduction. You know, if you're going to do something, what what it's it's, it's the circumstances in which it's happened, I think, is the the well, worry. You know, I mean, for me, that in in a, it's it's like saying, well, you know what, we'll we'll change a football match halfway through and decide that we're going to stop the uh, offside rule, um, and uh, we'll change things there just because it's not going very well uh, for the sides that we want it to. The whole thing is ridiculous. Well, yeah, there are those who say, don't you do that anyway, <laughs> change the rules around time when you see some of the decisions, <laughs> to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah. I, mean, uh, well. I, I don't think that's necessarily uh, incorrect. You know? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it, it also as well, they're not allowed the rules to bet. I know the big rules have been around since 2013, yeah. but leave it for a couple of years. You don't just change it after year one when there's been a couple of commissions. And, and I do I do get why, why they look at it, but it, it just seems strange that all of a sudden, some of the bigger clubs are a bit worried, and it, it goes back. Where is the power in the Premier League? Is it the Premier League, or is that the Premier League as as a business, which it is? It's too rel- totally reliant on the big six, isn't it? Yeah. At the end of the day, which yeah. is, which is now a big seven, yeah, isn't it? I agree. And 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 that that is the concern, isn't it? And we have seen in the past. You know, you you are being accused of kowtowing down to the big six, but this this appears to be an example. With all due respect to those clubs and fans of those clubs, where actually they are looking at favour and I wouldn't say, you know, in in not, not explicitly, but are taking more into account their yeah, views well, than well, other clubs. They are. I mean, you know, you can't have absolutely. You know, you can't have one rule for one and one for another just because their lawyers can push things down and down and down and down until it doesn't matter. Right? Things the way they've broken rules. This should, this should all should be sorted at the same time. Um, look, Gavin, thank you very much indeed for kicking this hour off in this way. Uh, really good to talk to you at Everton. Jack Sullivan is going to be joining us after the break, but just want to get the thoughts of Gavin McGaw right now as well, a former EFL executive here on what he's heard so far. Um, yeah, Gavin, I mean, you know, for me, I just, the, the, midweek this week, I threw my hands in the air. I've got nobody to talk to except the dog. And um, she's not that interested in Manchester City anyway. So um, we didn't really get very far with the conversation. But um, what's going on? Look, Mark, I think this is inevitable, isn't it? We are seeing for the first time the the regulations start to bite. What Gavin was saying there was incorrect. These rules have been around for years. But the reason why it's started to become a problem, why they're probably flexing around the Premier League table to try and look different things, is because it's starting to hurt so many teams because of COVID. No one ever thought Mm. they would breach these rules. There is a huge amount there. It's very much, uh, much more generous than the UEFA financial uh, fair play rules. Um, and it's not just the clubs at the top. I suspect actually what we're seeing is a change with the other 14 clubs who are looking at this as a much more of a threat to them and seeing it also, like you and I have discussed with Andrew many times, mm. the, the profit and sustainability rules actually help the big six more than they help everyone else because no one else can compete no one else can challenge so you've got this weird situation where the bigger clubs want to continue to compete in europe and they don't mind overspending the uefa rules because they just put a contribution in if they do uh, and they want something similar here so they can continue to compete uh, against other european clubs and actually dominate against other european clubs and the smaller clubs are wanting to be able to compete just in the premier league so you've got this dissent i suspect that's happening around the table but what i would say is just add some caution because because these have been leaked and often, uh, as we've mm. seen over recent months and weeks, uh, Mark, clubs leak things on purpose to set 
different narratives. And I wouldn't be surprised if these came from certain clubs who have maybe had point deductions thrown at them in uh, recent weeks. So that's why it's interesting hearing from Everton oh. and others. I'm a bit more sceptical about all of this. Oh, well, like, what you, we... you know, I mean, you, you, of course, you know, that's the, the, the way the governments of the day have been doing it for years in the front of the broadsheets recently and uh, over the... Is, uh, trying something out to see what the uh, population thinks. This is exactly the same, I, I agree. Look, Gav, hang on there a minute. I'm sorry the hours got disrupted a little bit, uh, but Andrew Mills is somewhere in the ether. Andrew? I'm with you. Good I'm man. With you. Uh, as a chief executive, as a chief executive, you'd have been one of the first if you would, you know, Brentford had ever been in the Premier League when you were there. You'd have been banging your hand on thumping the desk, saying, "Well, we've got to have this rule sorted out for all of us, not just for the privileged few." Well, I think uh, I mean I'm a little bit more sceptical than than Gavin. Um, so I, you know, certainly COVID affected the businesses um, to a significant degree, but. I don't think this is. I don't think this has got any uh, anything to do with COVID. I think this has got very much to do with the fact that actually some of the sanctions are starting to bite, and you know, sporting sanctions feel unjust because the the, the those that they affect most are those that you uh, mentioned earlier, which is you know the supporters that are either paying to watch it on the television, paying to go through the gates, or or paying to kind of uh, stream the service some other how. But but essentially they're paying, um, and so. As we've started to see those the, those kind of the, the sanctions start to have an effect, now the reality is, you know, there are teams that that should be able to flex their muscles because their businesses would allow them to, but they can't. And so I actually think everybody's started to look at the this in mm. reality rather than in concept, and actually realise just how inconvenient to some of those business plans it is. So um, with what we've done in this hour, and uh, I'm going to speak to Jack Sullivan, the uh, uh, youngest director with uh, West Ham United and co-owner of Supply Life uh, for 10-15 minutes, guys. And then I'd like to come back to you for the whole of the final uh, stage of this particular hour with your thoughts and plenty more of them as well. It's Talk TV. If you're just joining us, you missed some terrific stuff. There's been some great thoughts on the great footballing life of Joe Kinnear, who sadly died at the age of 77, and some really good football fan chat about some of the big games over the weekend. You can follow it all, if you've missed it, in the podcast. Get to the back of the stand! Republic of Mike Graham. Ah! Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Ooh, uh, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on mm. the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you know? laughs> yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <it's not. laughs> Well, just to tidy up the uh, football today, some late football as well, and uh, Forest nothing uh, in the end against Spurs. They lost by three goals to one, still deep uh, in relegation trouble at the moment. We're going to talk West Ham United. We're going to talk to uh, a young man now who perhaps, uh, for many of us, at the age of 17, uh, got the opportunity to become a director of West Ham United women's football team. And now he's very much part of West Ham United as a director and uh, as uh, one of the big players, and quite rightly too. And I'm glad that there are young men like Jack who are now part of the boards up and down the land because there are many of us who've been through three generations and more who really think that, you know what, it is time to uh, listen to what those, the same age as players and others, getting involved as fans in the game and what they want as well as what we used to want. Jack, very good evening and welcome to uh, Talk TV and to the Sunday Night Club and it's great to have you with us. Thank you, thank you for having me. No, oh, no, look, yeah, really looking forward to this. We've got plenty to talk about. I do want to talk obviously about the, 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 the charity month as it is as well with um, the irritable bowel system and coming on to that if we may a little later on. But I want to start a little bit with you. I know Chigwell and the school very well. My old man, bless him, who's no longer with us, um, was a PE teacher in Essex and took Mervyn Day to West Ham and also Matt Holland, um, who West Ham in the end decided wasn't quite right, but uh, we went on to Bournemouth and uh, other things. So uh, I know a little bit about West Ham. I know a lot about Chigwell as well, because I used to play for a school that used to come along there and get beaten every time at cricket. But uh, you've had a good upbringing uh, you've had, a, am sure, a, a fantastic and fascinating one. So tell us a little bit about your early life, first of all, when, uh, you know, even as a teenager, business was probably in the blood, if I can put it that way. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure it was, it, was, it was in the blood, but it was definitely part of just life. Um, I was very lucky that Dad, from a very young age, had, had always let me and Dave into meetings, speak to people, have those sorts of conversations. Um, and we was always in the boardroom, whether it was at Birmingham before West Ham and then obviously in, into West Ham after. Um, so, yeah, we was always, he would always say, this is why I'm making this decision. This is how I, I, I think it should work and this is why it should work. And then um, and then he'd also let us sort of say, well, what would you do in this situation and things like that. So, I don't know, I suppose it was, it was a... Um, it was one of those things that that was always quite quite natural. And a PE teacher actually said to me when I was younger, "There's there's three ways of learning: listening, doing, and seeing." And I suppose the first two 
me and me and Dave from 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 a young age always always sort of picked up from from dad and only as I've got older I've I've been able to do the do the third one and, and actually go and go and do it myself. And to be fair to uh, David uh, uh, as well is uh, that. You know, he's, he gave Karen Brady an incredible chance. He sees he sees things in younger people, and has the balls actually to let them get on with it and let you get on with it, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I hope so. Um, he, yeah, he's always in the in the sort of mind that if he thinks someone's good enough, they're old enough, and and if if he believes in someone, he he definitely does let them let them go and do it. Although. I'm sure Karen would say, and, and I'm sure anyone at West Ham would say, if they do it wrong, they get told rather quickly. Right, right. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, no, it's uh, we, he's lucky, and, he, and he's, he's to be honest, a great, a great person where he does let you sort of, um, well, hopefully fly, and then, um, and then, and then he's he's there as well if, if things don't go so well. So no, he's um, it, as you said, he's, he gave Karen, and and I, I was lucky enough also to be to be given a chance to. As you mentioned earlier, run, run the women's mm. team for for four years as well. I mean that was important, but I think now as well, I do think there are a lot of us that, uh, as we get a little bit older, if I can put it that way, that we think we know everything. But what we don't always know is what the the next generation that you, as businessmen and women, need at West Ham United, which is a fan base that you understand and they understand you. And I think that from that point of view, you, you, you in your early 20s, is, that's a really good thing for you to get your, your hands dirty with. Yeah, no, to, to, to be honest, I, I, I agree. And to be honest, what, what we all want is we all want to win games and, and that, that's the most important thing. I don't think however old you are or, or young, everyone, everyone wants to do the best as possible and, and, and win as much as possible. And... Um, and yeah, I suppose for for us, we've we've had some challenges at West Ham, mm. but hopefully we're we're keeping to our promise of of European football, of, of, of reason why we moved to the to the stadium, and and for us that's that's the important thing to to try and keep doing that, to try and grow revenues, to make sure that all of that money goes back on to the players and back on to the um, in, in investment into the football club to make sure the football club can continue to grow. Uh, with that, of course, and you will have seen all of that, the change from uh, the bowling grounds to now, obviously, uh, your new stadium, uh, the, the, this great London stadium uh, that you have that has been difficult for some fans to get used to, but, but a lot of them have, particularly when you're doing so well. That You know, it, it's an ever-changing uh, and, and differential sort of aspect for you to look at. And part of this hour, we've been talking about how, you know, with... Certain clubs under COVID have had problems. Others have been fined for points because they've not kept to financial fair play. Uh, would you be part of, yeah, we've all got to get it right, but in the end, we are individual businesses that need to be able to react to not just uh, UK, but international problems like we had with COVID and other things and to just run as a business? Yeah, I, I think obviously... To be honest, most football clubs, and that's it's the same whether it's West Ham or, or Dagenham and Redbridge. No, none of them are run like businesses. They're run all a bit crazy, and it's fine. It's fine, fine margins. But I, I and, and obviously there's a lot of passion, and there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, I don't know. There's so many different things that that sort of make football so different. But I, I, I think definitely the, the Premiership football clubs are run by some of the most successful and intelligent people. And they really understand football. You've seen lots and lots of businessmen come into football and not be able to get it right. And I think the one thing with obviously with the regulator potentially coming in and things like that, there, there obviously is a bit of bit of nervousness that these people have never run football clubs and they're going to they're going to try and tell us how to run football clubs. But it's um, it's it's one of those things. The one thing I don't think any of us want to see is um, like another Berry or someone like mm. that. And 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 for football clubs to go out of out of business and, and to not exist anymore and that that's a complete disaster and i think that's the whole reason why we put in ffp and all of those different things but like anything you you put stuff in with the with the best intentions and as things move and as things change then sometimes you have to i suppose 
um, change change tack maybe in, in yeah. certain ways and and move move on with the times as, as you mentioned earlier really yeah i mean that that, that is an important and i mean you've mentioned dagenham and redbridge already and the football pyramid without the football pyramid we perhaps don't get the fans that you know they have local clubs in the essex area that they will follow but they may with west ham find a club that they want to join as season ticket holders, they want to go and watch a Premier League football and European football, that they can have, in a way, the best of both worlds if you, as a board, get it right within the rules. Yeah, I, I think 100%. And to be honest, we, we actually have a really good relationship with, with, with Dagenham our, ourselves. The women's team plays there. Um, and I, I, I speak to them a lot. And it's the exact same challenges that Dagenham have, we have, just with a few more zeros, basically. And um, we're all trying to generate more fans. We're all trying to um, break even or, or, um, or and improve the squad and do all of these sorts of types of things, alongside, most importantly, being successful on the pitch, um, whether that's them getting out of the National League or whether that's us hopefully getting into the Champions League or maybe one day winning, <laughs> winning the league. Um, but it's... Uh, but yeah, no, all, all of all of the exact same challenges, and and as I said earlier, that the biggest thing for us is to make sure that the football club is run sustainably and, and correctly. That after our time, that there still is a football club there, and and um, and and that's that's the most important thing for us, really. I knew David Moyes as a 25-year-old sitting on the bus as a young reporter, as I was when he played for Cambridge United, knowing he wanted to be a manager. All he ever wanted to talk about, and we sat next to each other on away games and. He'd play and say, I've had enough of this. I want to learn about everything. He's done so well with you on both the, the, the two times he's now been, uh, been with you. Do you think as well uh, for you that the connectivity because of your age um, with the players, that you have got to know perhaps some of these players more than the older board members would have done? Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure, to be honest. They... The, the players had a fantastic relationship with with obviously David Gold, who's who's passed now. He used to go to the training grounds and uh, every Friday for for lunch with with, with them. Um, and I, I think depending on 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 any age, to be to be honest with you, um, they they can they can have a great relationship with 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 anyone. I, I'm sure a lot of them see David Gold, uh, David Moyes as almost a father figure, <laughs> um, and I and I, I think that's really really special and 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 it's a ni nice connection. I, uh, may, maybe they might speak to me about slightly different stuff than what they what they speak to speak to him about. Um, but but yeah, no, I, I think it's um, it's it's as you said. I think there's there's no harm having mm. lots of different eyeballs and, and different ages because people see things differently at all all ages. Whether mm. it's dad who's seen it and done it a thousand times, or whether it's me with a with a with a fresh sort of face and, and eyes, and um, me or me or David and. I think that can only be yeah. only be good for a, for a football club, really. We, we we like people on this show as well who are fans as well as being involved in football and who have uh, charitable causes that are, are close to their heart. Now, April month is uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. What, what connection have you had with that? Yeah, so so I've I've invested in a in a business called called Supply Life. We do food intolerance testing. We test over. 209 foods um and we we thought this month with, with it being being ibs awareness month we can help a lot of people suffering with bloating uh constipation diarrhea um all all of these like flatulence all, all really glamorous stuff uh, um that that i think uh, and, and we basically just wanted to say look if you are suffering from that um april is the month and, and ibs is a bit of a scary term that i think a lot of people are, are a bit scared about where one in three people suffer from some form of IBS in, in the in in the UK, and we, we wanted to say, look, if it, if it's not normal, then then look, let's let's see if we can we can help people and try and shout from the rooftops as as much as we can in part of April to to say, look, we we can help you at Supply Life, and and mm. and to to say if it is isn't uh, if you are suffering from those issues, it isn't normal, and and hopefully we we can help really. I love the connection for you with that and your company, and obviously being a director of a football club. You know that fitness and everything is so important. I know that there are players, uh, there are many of us who, perhaps it could just be a change of uh, milk to lactose free or whatever it is within a, a very simple stage that people like yourselves can help others. Yeah, no, 100%. We we test over 209 different different foods, whether that's 
cow's milk, uh, eggs, uh, loads and loads of different nuts. And I think with our with our way that that we that we work now, or, or the that life is now, we all grab a sandwich from from Pret, or we 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 go very convenient with our with our food choices. And we're trying to say, look, then, and also a lot of dishes now they have ten different ingredients in in them and things like that. So we try and sort of highlight that and say, look. We, we can help you decide what foods these are and actually use food as fuel rather than making you feel tired after you eat or, or this, that and the other. And and we're trying to sort of highlight that food co- food comas aren't aren't necessarily normal and that, that that a lot of people think really. So so yeah, we're trying to shout that from from the rooftops really. Fantastic uh, stuff, Jack. Uh, just one final thing as well. I mean, Im- important for you. Are you still a good fan? Or do you find it difficult as being on the board that you have other things to think about? Um, to, to be honest with you, yes. Uh, for, for, for me and I think for the whole family, to, to win in Prague last year was uh, just incredible. Um, I think you probably see things slightly slightly differently than, than maybe, maybe the fans. And you also are a bit more involved. So when something happens, you can sort of understand why it happens maybe, maybe a bit more. But I, I like to think so. And... I'm still a bit heart heart on heart on my sleeve a little bit, probably a bit too much. Um, but it's uh, we 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 try and we're like look as we said we we all want to win and we all get frustrated when when things don't work as well. But mm. we we maybe have to keep our uh, keep our mouths shut a bit bit more than uh, a bit more than the than the average average fan. But 100, percent we we're still very much supporters and we still want what's best and and the values of the football club like. Our academy, uh, affordable family football, yeah. inspiring the next generation, and to be honest, we're we're part of one of the few shareholders in in England that or, or clubs in England that still run or Premier League that still run by English people as well. So yeah. we're we're keen to to keep that to keep that going forward and Brilliant. and to and to still have that impact. Really fantastic. Well, look, you're also now a, a Sunday night club uh, member because uh, of this of your debut. I think it was a pretty decent debut. Talking from a sporting point of view, I don't think uh, really you got caught offside at, at any stage. So thank you so much indeed uh, for joining us, Jack, and let's hope we speak again soon. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. Your illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, it's been a busy hour and we've uh, had all sorts of uh, other bits and pieces uh, to have uh, into the uh, show. So we're going to go back to Gavin Begore and Andrew Mills very shortly. Uh, just a quick word then with uh, uh, Forest Blogger and today Brighton Jogger, Des Oldham. Tell us more, Des. You've uh, had a busy old day. I have. I've uh, run the Brighton Marathon and then made a mad dash across to North London to watch the game. I, I actually got in after the Forest goal. So it, it wasn't that successful in the end. Well, we, we can't, we can see you just about, but we can hear you perfectly. So we can't see if you're bushed or not, but uh, great effort as always uh, for anybody that's uh, involved in a in a marathon and, and what have you. Uh, not to be in the end today at Forest. No, they, they just come up short. Tottenham are a bit of a, it's a game that we look at and probably think we're going to get nothing in. And we've got that equaliser, so you think we've got a chance, you know, to, to take something. Sometimes Tottenham and Peter are out towards the end of the game. But they come out of second half and blew us apart, to be honest. So, That's tough it. one to take, but we'll go again. And just finally, what, what about this, tech, this uh, deduction now rather uh, than points, but with... Uh, financial implications for clubs? I don't think... Yeah, it... I'm, I'm not a massive fan of it, to be honest, Mark. I, I don't get it. I, I think... I, I, obviously, we don't want to see teams get points taken off them. That's that, that's not really a thing, is it? We, we spoke about that a lot. But, but if, if teams can spend all the money they want to and then to find them, you know, they'll just take it. They'll yeah. just take it. What they have to do is get the rules right and get the punishments right. And if we know what the punishments and the rules are, everybody has to work with them and they have to make it fair and competitive, not let the big clubs spend all the money and the small clubs spend nothing. Perfect. And then... Perfect. Des, uh, we'll talk more in detail. Go and put your feet up. You deserve it. Gavin McGall will have enjoyed that, former chair of Park Run and uh, still a big runner himself. And uh, Andrew Mills, who I, I, I'm not sure that Andrew does run anywhere anymore, actually, if he ever did, Gav. He's a cyclist, Andrew. Oh, oh, is he really? He's a lycra boy, yeah. is he? He is. He likes his lycra. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, look, so, you know, first of all, uh, how close are we, do you think, to Everton and knowing more about that, what's going on there? Do you think there were uh, any news on that? I think it's imminent, Mark. I think uh, it's probably likely to come tomorrow or Tuesday at the latest, but I suspect tomorrow. 
Uh, and I think it'll be tough. I think we've seen with the Everton and also the Leicester City uh, financial reporting that they've, uh, they've made to companies how, just how, how bad things are. And it's been slightly disingenuous, really, what they've both been saying to the media and the fans to try and carry favour. Because when you actually look at the numbers, it's not good reading. So I would be very worried if I was Everton. Um, you know, they'll look at double jeopardy and all of that. But I think they will get additional points deductions uh, in the next couple of days for sure. Well, what's your take before we join the Lycra boy very shortly on uh, these other fines and trying to change? Are they trying to change the rules or is this just, uh, as you were saying earlier, one of these things they're putting out there to see which way fans take it? I think it was a very good point you made, Mark, that they are probably testing the water or it could be clubs like Forest and Everton are trying to leak it to try and put pressure on for different sorts of uh, approaches round the table. Look, there's there's definitely, everyone's definitely unsettled because these have started to bite, as Andrew said earlier. Mm. Um, that means there will be a debate going on. We have ourselves discussed whether a sort of luxury tax would be the best way forward. Um, and it would allow smaller clubs to compete uh, in the sense they could spend more. It's just really dangerous, though, isn't it, to do that in a way if you allow a club to potentially have an owner disappear and leave a mess behind. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be carefully done. It's not just as simple as spending what you like and getting a fine. What happens if the owner isn't there? Or how do we cover the costs to ensure an owner cannot destroy a club's future? That is key. And, you know, we'll see other clubs affected. Chelsea are bound to uh, be affected going forward um, mm -hmm. if this doesn't come in. Uh, Andrew, good evening again. Hey, Ben James. I tell you what, I'm, come the Tour de France, um, you, 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 <laughs> you're going to be part of that. There's no getting away from it. I think I think that ship possibly may have sailed, <laughs> albeit that uh, it would definitely be fun for the first hour. <laughs> Brilliant. So w where are we? Actually, I don't know if you heard the chat there with Jack Sullivan. I quite like the idea of having youngsters, uh, if they've got something to say or they understand business, in a boardroom with old, older people. What do you, what do you guys, Andrew first, what do you think? Um, what do I think? I think you went very easy on him. Um, yeah, I did. I, yeah, <laughs> look, much, much as you say, Mark, I, you know, I genuinely feel that we need to have, you know, the, the, the beauty of youth is, is the want to change the world and want to change things, uh, to improve things and not just keep things running because that's the way they've been done previously. So there's certainly, um, it certainly is a necessity um, and I think the more people that you can have that actually have an understanding of the mechanics and the complicated mechanics of, of, of how you run a, a, a kind of a, a sports facing business, then the better. But um, be interesting to know just exactly how involved that, that Jack is and, and how much he's allowed to see, because mm. the, the, the more that he can get to grips with with the with the nuts and bolts of it, I think the better for for him and for for whatever football clubs he's, he's involved with going forward. Um, uh, Gavin has said, you know, within 24, 48 hours, more on Everton. Uh, what are we expecting? Is there any thought? Have you got any expectations on what what might happen next? Um, I I think much the same as Gavin's saying. I, I you know it's. It, it's difficult because I think these rules were set up in concept and now what we're seeing is the reality. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the the, the word is that there is a, an, another charge coming. Um, I can't help but think that, you know, the teams that, that, that do fall foul of it and do get dock points for it now will be mounting legal challenges in three years' time, which will come to nothing because by then the damage will be done. Mm. Um, so I do see complications, but I think that... that that until there is another way, until the Premier League has accepted and voted for the percentage and for the luxury, which um, Gavin rightly suggested, I think um, I think Everton, Forest, and and maybe a couple of others, albeit that again, let's see where let's see where we are in a year. But I've I've got a feeling these rules change before the likes of Chelsea and Manchester City fall foul. Yeah, and Gavin, just about Everton again. Then I mean, where so are we? If there's another points deduction here. Uh, this is going to really complicate the bottom of the Premier League, isn't it? Yeah, and I think this is one of the reasons why, Mark, people are getting concerned by the potential threat to integrity of the competition. Because mm -hmm. if Everton get a point deduction tomorrow, whether it's four points, whatever, um, it is 
they'll then appeal undoubtedly because they did last time mm -hmm. uh, and that then makes it really difficult to get to the June cut-off for the AGM and the Premier League and know exactly who's coming up and who's going down so it's really mm -hmm. dangerous and it just makes the last day of the season a bit of a joke and I, I don't think anyone's happy around the Premier League table of that sort of thing happening um, but we're going to have to watch this space I do mm -hmm. fear though that um, there will be challenges made uh, and appeals made when frankly everyone's, everyone's just crack on because we've seen before the damage of it. Well, yeah, Andrew, this, I mean, this isn't yachting where it's all decided it, it afterwards in the clubhouse. No, and therein lies the issue is, is uh, you know, the beauty of this used to be that, that you, get, you get what you see, you say what you see. Um, and, and as we've started to suggest in the last few weeks, it's got more and more, it's crept more and more into live, the live event, watching live football, watching Luton, Instead of being engrossed in in their 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 in, incredible kind of challenge to try and stay up by 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 the fingernails, you're actually thinking, well, at what point at what point does this change? And it's now become it's almost become there's a VAR during the 90 minutes, and there's almost now a VAR kind of system running during the week, which also affects the game. And just finally, in 20 odd seconds or so, uh, Gavin, uh, when this comes out now, is there going to be a real mess? Well, I, I actually think it's a lot cleaner now, okay. in, in, a, in a way, because it's coming out now. The question is how quickly an appeal process can happen if they appeal, with everyone's eyes on the June AGM. That's the key date for everything. Brilliant. Uh, Gavin and uh, Andrew, as always, thank you very much indeed. Very much part of the Sunday nightclub. In the last hour, we've got cricket to look forward to. It's already started. There's already been such excitement in the county championship. It is early these days, isn't it? But it's there. Neil Burns and Angus Fraser with that. Jeremy Dale on the Masters to come next week. Tony Jardine on a 1-2 for Red Bull in Japan next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. There's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> There's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. The illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a gun. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on Talk TV. Thoughts of the Masters to come a little later on in this hour with uh, Jeremy Dale and uh, Tony Jardine on uh, Red Bull powering once more with uh, their finish in Japan. Let's start though with the new uh, county cricket season that's got underway. It's so much earlier, isn't it, these days, but it's there. I always used to get excited um, when uh, some of uh, our guests in the past, like Derek Pringle playing for the Cambridge or Oxford Universities, would be... Um, trying to score a thousand runs before the uh, uh, May was out and, uh, and everything uh, like that. But um, there's one man who could possibly do it very quickly. And Angus Fraser, uh, what a game going on. What a track at Lords. Neil Burns as well. Very good evening to both of you. Glamorgan 620 for three declared. Middlesex um, looking as if they're safely home to see out the draw now. 460 for five. Um, what a wicket! Yeah, it's, uh, it's <laughs> uh, yeah, not maybe the traditional sort of a start to the season you expect, where seam bowlers are nipping around everywhere. But actually, I think that sort of uh, view is a bit—I wouldn't say it's a myth, but it's it's not backed up by statistics because even though it is cold, it is wet, and there is moisture in the pitches, mm. the scores in April historically have been pretty good, actually. But yeah, no, Sam Northeast um, batted beautifully, I think. Middlesex dropped him. Well, no, Middlesex dropped him a couple of times. Well, dropped him early on. I think mm. that it's not as expensive as the one that uh, went, allowed Brian Lowry to get 501, but I think it cost, <laughs> it's cost about 320 runs or something like that. Um, but he batted beautifully, made the most of sort of some do a docile pitch, mm. an attack that was finding its way, short boundary, and a Cookerborough ball, which is uh, what we're using at this moment in time. Um, and and uh, I say the scores around the country have been pretty good in most matches. Well, I, so I, no. I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned the Cookerborough. And Neil, good evening to you as well. Um, good evening. It doesn't do an awful lot at times, does it? It doesn't, but <clears throat> unfortunately, the lawmakers in the game tend to be former batsmen. <laughs> and <laughs> I would love to see more of an even contest between bat and ball, because once you take the contest out of the contest, then the game is less interesting. Mm -hmm. And having these run fests, um, I think, creates a false picture of people's ability and um, potential chances of, of playing for England. The other thing that's disappointed me in this first round of fixtures is that Somerset have decided not to select Show Bashir mm -hmm. in their starting 11 for their fixture against Kent at Canterbury. And they may pay dearly for that tomorrow because the game is evenly balanced. Somerset have got a lead of 90 going into the final day and I'm sure they would welcome having a top quality spin bowler who was good enough to dismiss Indian test batsman only a month ago 
Uh, but he's going to be watching from the sidelines. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, a, a great shame. I can understand uh, that in all. Just one thing, going back though to North East and that, uh, that uh, sort of a, at Lords for you as an individual to score in the professional game, 335 not out or whatever it is. I mean, something never to be forgotten. Well, it's the highest score by an individual batsman at Lords. I yeah. mean, that is a huge record and something to be incredibly proud of. I mean, you've gone past Graham Gooch, you've got 333, which was the previous ties. So, no, it's a fantastic achievement. Um, obviously, it's not the same as scoring 333 in in, in the summer against uh, India or anything like that, but it's it's an interesting one. I, I hear what Neil's sort of saying, but I also think that the Dukes ball has done too much at the start of seasons and you don't want games ending in two and a bit games. So it's getting the balance right and the balance is sort of obviously in our match at Lords has, has got in the favour of the batters. But I think bowlers have got to learn to bowl with in difficult conditions. You look at the best bowlers that the game's produced and they tend to be Australians and South Africans, a lot of them. And they're brought up on a kookaburra ball where you've got to work for your wickets. You don't just plonk mm. it on a length and it does something. You, you've got to bend your back and do a bit more. So it, it's gone too far in this game probably, but but I think uh, it's a bit of an eye-opener to bowlers and the fact that uh, if you're going to play at the highest level, you've got to be a bit more a bit better than you currently are. What's the sense, Neil, of where the county championship stands now? Firstly, for those that want to watch these matches live, um, there are a, a lot of older people who've got time on their hands and it's a terrific place to go and watch and you become a member of a county and, and you can really enjoy your cricket. Um, there's other opportunities to listen to it or watch it and, and what have you. Um, where are we, though? It's something that we've we've often talked about here, how important still county cricket is for the development of our test-playing nation. Well, I think it's very important, but the structure underneath the international team has to have a very clear purpose. It can't just exist for its own ends unless it's funding itself. And fundamentally, 18 county cricket clubs receive circa £3 million a year each from the ECB to ensure the England cricket team is successful. Hmm. And the England cricket team has been hugely unsuccessful against India in India and hugely unsuccessful against Australia in Australia. And as one of three nations that receives the lion's share of the ICC's money, that as a track record is poor. And I think one of the strengths of Australian cricket down the years has been the quality of their Sheffield Shield. Mm. Um, and I think English county cricket has got to take a long, hard look at itself. But unfortunately, the constitution doesn't allow for leading cricket minds to have the influence because ultimately it's the county chairman and their members who decide the way forward. And Andrew Strauss put his ideas forward and unfortunately has been lost, at least for the time being, to English cricket. Yeah, that's a good point you make. Uh, Angus, from your point of view as well, in in the positions that you've had since you retired as a as a player as well, um, w we do we need to look, uh, don't we? As Neil was uh, putting so eloquently there, that we, we we need something special to happen now, and that we get this right. We can't continue to linger, or else we lose everything with the next generation. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, one of the big things that, and I, whilst we, in these conversations, we've been questioning of England's test approach. I mean, they've certainly played with a view that they want to inspire the next generation to play cricket and, and get youngsters watching and, and following and being interested in test cricket, hence the sort of aggressive attacking cricket that they're trying to play. Um, well, there's always that battle, should counties adopt that or do counties, they've got people working there trying to, and careers and, and and develop cricketers in the best th way that they think is possible. And uh, yeah, I mean, the dids we're, we're one game into the season. Uh, I mean, such so many conversations this time of the year. Oh, blimey, it's early in the year, isn't it? And uh, we used to start, I think, about the nineteenth, twentieth, when when Neil and I were playing. So yeah. we didn't even report back to the first of April. Uh, so it it does start earlier. There's going to be some sort of bits and pieces, but the county championship is, is really important because. Um, it is the place where you produce test cricketers or the next generation of cricketers. And it's going to be the place in a couple of weeks' time where Joe Root and, and Harry Brook come to play Middlesex at Lords in their preparations to have a good summer. Yeah. Oh, so I was actually laughing on a, a bit of X that we used to call Twitter, Neil, earlier this week when uh, Darren Cousins was 
talking with Mark Eilert about bleeps and uh, the ru the running, of course, that you had to do. Probably not at the start of your career either. Well, I think sports scientists have had a larger influence over professional cricket in the last 20 years. But um, from when I first started at Essex in 1982, 1983, um, we had a couple of cricketers who I think were ahead of their time. One in J.K. Lever, who was a very fit bowler and hardly ever got injured throughout a 24, 25 year exceptional career. And Graham Gooch was also one of the first people to take physical fitness very seriously. So I grew up at a club that was very ambitious. Every point mattered, every day mattered. It was about winning trophies and people giving themselves the best chance to be successful. There is a danger that county cricket now um, has, in my view, gone a little bit too far towards the physical side and ultimately cricket's a game of skill with bat and ball and there needs to be scope for people of all shapes and sizes but the bottom line is people have got to take five or six wickets in an innings if you're a bowler and if you're a batsman you've got to score big hundreds to put your team, your team into a dominant position. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you on that absolutely with uh, that. Do you think as well the other thing, Angus, that it is difficult for, for fans of cricket um, that we, when we didn't have social media, we didn't have so much television, we would know what was on, which was usually a John Player or whatever, the 40 overs at the, uh, uh, on the Sunday would be live. Uh, you'd get uh, the test matches live and then you'd get what was the Gillette, over 60 overs in those days. Like, you knew where all the calendar was. Do you think that that is something that has, has always sort of got in the way of, of certain structure for people that want to watch a whole cricket season these days? Yeah, I mean, there's a structure, but the, I think a lot of the sort of most avid cricket lovers don't like the structure because we're not playing county cricket maybe in the heat, heart of the summer in July and August. That's when it's almost handed over to the 100 and to T20 mm -hmm. type of thing. So the championship's been pushed into April, May, June, and September, although there are a few more games sort of in, in July and August this time of the year. But mm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's that constant battle, isn't it, between uh, the importance of generating some income and counties have a chance to generate income in the, in the T20s and, and trying to give them the best opportunity to that. So you're giving them warm summer evenings rather than uh, cold April or, or, or May afternoons as such. But uh, it's, I mean, the, we, we, every year there are changes in some shape or form, and I suppose uh, because of that, um, people are wondering, is it five points for a draw, is it eight points for a draw, bonus points change, and, and things like that. But people are trying to do, well, people make the decisions they're making in an attempt to make it better and, to, and for good. Um, some work, some don't. Mm. I went, um, actually, I, I, I used to always go as a schoolboy to Fenners when, when I grew up in Cambridge to, to watch a lot of the games pre-season and then going on uh, until the end of the university term with sides like Essex and JK swinging it all over the place on Fenners and, and what have you, Neil. And uh, going to North Ants last year for the first time to watch a, a county championship match for some time uh, because of work and everything, I'd forgotten how much... I still really enjoy following the complexities of how you play out a four-day match and, and, the, and the, the, the little differences that can make all the difference, skill with captaincy, with, with batting, with bowling, when to go, when not to go, when to... Dip. And, and, I, and I found that, you know, I'd, I'd missed watching that. There is no substitute, is there, of getting people into the grounds if you can. Yeah, I think that's very important. But one of the other great things that's happened in county cricket in recent times has been the advent of live streaming. Mm. So people are able to not just follow the scores, and initially that was enhanced 20, 30 years ago by CFAX and Teletext. But now that you've not just got the internet to update you, you're able to watch this mm. live footage. And the fact it's straight down the barrel so you can see the game from a technical level is, is a wonderful view. Mm. Um, but from a um, cricket development point of view, one of the things that concerns me um, has been the lack of long form cricket that many young cricketers mm. play. So you mentioned about Cambridge universities that back in the day, um, it was a wonderful opportunity for 
um, some of England's greatest players to bat at Fenners. You're talking about people like you know Peter May and yeah. uh, Ted Dexter, and then naturally people like Michael Atherton. A whole month or maybe five weeks of top level cricket against professionals who wanted um, to get lots of overs under their belts mm. or wanted to make 100 to get their season up and running. So that was a really good opportunity. And I think in the last 20 years, initially ECB and then MCC sponsored the university um, program, which I thought was really good because it got people uh, into top level cricket who were maybe late starters or late developers and Middlesex's current captain and their beneficiary this year and a cricketer I greatly admire, Toby Rowland Jones, Mm -hmm. was someone who, who benefited from being in that university program. Um, Andrew Strauss went to Durham University and I think his cricket underground foul and moved forward. Mm-hmm. And I think that may be something that, that, that cricket has um, overlooked in terms of its value. Uh, but we've got to get our second eleven cricket really strong. We've mm-hmm. got to get our club cricket really strong so that the infrastructure that underpins professional cricket is really healthy. Yeah, that's a good point. There was uh, I was uh, back in Cambridge uh, last week at my old school and... Um, they were talking about how a lot of people who played cricket at school and also play junior cricket were now a lot of them um, getting involved in football before cricket again because of this middle class, if I can put it that way, sway towards football being a profession for them now and how the figures are just beginning to come out that in 10 years time the middle class will have uh, taken a lot of these um, traditional uh, places within the professional game away from others who perhaps are not so so well off as families. And I and I wondered whether you both think, Angus, first of all, that that's something that that cricket will lose. I, I just I can't. I mean, obviously, the, I mean, cricket's been under the spotlight recently with the ICEC report, and um, and part of that that was cricket was sort of elitist, wasn't it? And mm. And you can see it. I mean, you, you only have to be a lord where there's an obsession with schools and where you're educated. It was sort of, well, which yeah. school did you go to? And it's like, well, if it's a good one. I mean, I always remember being on the committee and said, well, I was educated in Harrow too. But it was a gate in high school at the bottom of the hill, not the, not the one at the top of the hill. Uh, there's sort of a couple of draws back there. But no, cricket has got to, I mean, the, 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 the real challenge for cricket is to broaden the, the sort of base of the pyramid. And you do that by getting cricket played in as many schools as you can, and and I think that's the real challenge for cricket moving forward is to is to is to get it into uh, the sort of well, the comprehensive schools and and, and mm. places like that. But it's challenging when there's no fields anymore in inner London and places like that. Middlesex, all right, it's a unique place because it's an urban mm. county, um, but there are going to be hidden gems out there. There's a lad who I think was in the Saka, wasn't he? South of Stri- South, sorry, not South, South Asian. Uh, sort of academy mm. and he's got 100 in each innings this week for, for Worcestershire against Warwickshire so the, the real challenge is to get in there and find these little diamonds that are around and, and, and give them the chance to sort of play there against um, a lot of people who do come up from a slightly more privileged background. Yeah I mean the, there is certainly uh, club cricket is trying to do this and again the difference being Neil in some ways is as the next generations grow up they're you know, cricket was our club cricket for me was our thing. That's what I did every summer, um, once during the week, and every Saturday and Sunday, and hopefully play a bit of minor county cricket as well. Those things have changed quite a lot now. It's it is difficult to get more people involved the whole time and have uh, a reserve team as well as a first team and a junior team. Certain areas it works, but I think more could still be done, and with the help of the ECB. Well, I agree with you. And the wonderful news this week is that the government have agreed to invest £35 million into the game. And Ebony Rainford Brent and a number of other people have been at the forefront of bidding to return cricket to state schools. Uh, Anything that advances and enhances cricket, I'm a massive fan of. However, my wish is to see the clubs properly funded. And at the risk of embarrassing Angus, He is a wonderful example of a top-level cricket professional who is so committed to his local club. And funding, I think, needs to go into the clubs who have proved that over time 
that they can do it with volunteer support, that they have withstood all sorts of crises down the years, and they should not be taken for granted. That, I think, is where the money needs to go, uh, not into schools. I think that mm. is an area that's almost redundant for the game. And the key part about young people is can you get them to, tr to transition from plastic stumps and plastic balls and PR initiatives into actually playing the hardball game and being a not just a team member at a club, but a genuine club member mm. where you end up being an Angus Fraser or an Alex Stewart of this world who are really committed to their county, their country and their own local club. Yeah. And ultimately, if we're going to build a better future society, our sporting clubs, our hockey clubs, our football clubs, our rugby clubs, and particularly our cricket clubs, they need to be an absolute hub of taking care of young people and showing them the value of the role that sport can play in developing them as better quality mm -hmm. people who can serve the world in a really good way. I think one way that can be done in the, the amateur world of that at all levels as well, Angus, is that some of the clubs... Um, were stretched by count minor counties in in club cricket as well a lot where suddenly there was a there were bigger eastern regional uh competitions that took over more importance than not exactly local leagues but county leagues where you you could travel to and from and get back and still enjoy your own club later on in the evening if you needed to it wasn't too far to go whereas these there was an awful lot for a while where these particular tournaments just for club cricketers and for the youngsters traveling just too far to play a game yeah it's uh, i suppose if there was a there was a sort of clear way forward it would have been identified and, and then people have a different views and things mm. like that but i suppose that, that in league in club cricket they want the best playing the best and mm. you sort of sharpen the, the tip of that sort of pyramid don't you as much as you can um but it, there is a there is a consequence to that and it's 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 I suppose it's it's but what is I don't know I, I haven't uh, thanks for those kind words Neil but <laughs> having sort of been involved in club cricket and now my role at Middlesex which is more Middlesex in the community which is the sort of recreational participation side of the game and and yes you want a strong England side you want to to to, to your counties to be doing well but is cricket all about England is cricket all about um, counties really or, or is it about people getting together on a Saturday Sunday afternoon communities come together playing this game enjoying this game building relationships sharing special moments mm. uh, and and all the good it can do and as a byproduct of that yes a professional a mark rambrakash will come through or, or or someone like that and and suddenly sort of have a wonderful career but it's it's a really delicate one but is it about uh, you say all right the funding comes from the top and the funding was always there because they want to produce a good england team but mm. As Neil sort of said, I think that the, the 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 good it can do for community and the way that it can develop people and 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 sort of have a positive influence in their lives is is to some extent far more important than mm. whether Stoke, Ben Stokes get a fifty or or a hundred or an England win a Test match at times. Oh, that, that great points that both of you make. Um, lovely to talk to you at the start of a, another cricket season and. Thank you very much for being part of, as always, of the Sunday Night Club. Angus Fraser and Neil Burns there. Absolutely on it. Spot on, as always. It's the Masters coming up in just a few days' time. It's the start. It's the tournament that really kicks us off with the first of these four majors. And Tiger is going to be playing. Hopefully. Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknight at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, the Valspar will be for the Masters next week, and, uh, well, Tommy Fleetwood and Matt Fitzpatrick have both finished uh, in the top ten, which will be great for them before they move on to the Masters next week. And uh, Rory McIlroy had a much better day today so far. He's got four holes, I think it is, to play, or three. Uh, to come now. He's not going to win it unless Bathia, um does something absolutely stupid or McCarthy who uh, are uh, four and eight ahead of McElroy in third respectively but uh, for Rory um, you know he's uh, he's getting there. Let's uh, speak to a man who knows an awful lot more about this than I do. Jeremy Dale a PGA coach a great man to watch as a trick shot artist as well but much more than that and delighted to have him as part of our Monday night club and will be with us for the Masters next week as well which we're looking forward to just first of all I mean Rory finding a little bit more still needs as they set the, a bit of work on the the putting and one or two other bits of his game at the moment but but getting there again well, Rory does this on tour events. He he nearly always finishes in the top ten. So um, I wouldn't say that uh, that this week was anything different uh, from what he normally serves up. Yeah. Um, the big question is is whether he can complete the Grand Slam and and do it uh, in a major championship, which unfortunately he hasn't done for for you know a decade now. And uh, yeah, he's 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 a he's a frustrating watch, uh, but uh, but a joyous one as well. When he's on form, there's nothing better. No, he's not. Um, so, look, 
Uh, at the moment, well, that tournament just finishing off, but let's, let's start to talk about the Masters and look at the Masters, of course, which has a very different look about it, doesn't it, because of the invitational side of things to other tournaments. Well, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's an invitational event. As you rightly say, the Augusta National Golf Club have complete control over it. Uh, so it's not a PGA Tour event. It's not run, run by the USGA, the RNA. It's, it's, it's a law unto itself. Purely an invitational event. In fact, it, originally, Bobby Jones, who was the founder of, uh, of, of, the, of the Augusta National, didn't want to call it the Masters. He, it's actually called them the, on the invitation that the players get. Yes. Uh, the Augusta National Invitational Tournament. And uh, Jones was much more low-key. He didn't really like the, the sort of self-promotion of the Masters title, but uh, uh, I think it works pretty well. Um, but yes, it's a different thing. Uh, and also, of course, uh, one of the four times this year when we're going to get the Live players and the PGA Tour players together. So it's, it's different this year uh, entirely. I mean, there's always, um, with this thought, I'm going to start with him uh, as well, Tiger Woods and where he is and will it happen? Well, I, I think... Um, we have to be realistic. He hasn't actually completed a four-round tournament no. for, for a couple of years. Uh, if he makes the cut, well done. If he can actually play for the next two days, even better. Uh, I'm not expecting anything more than that from him. Um, I think Tiger's best days are unfortunately behind him now, but um, he's not quite ready, I don't think, in his own mind anyway, for the ceremonial tee-off, which is the traditional way that the Masters <laughs> gets underway. I think he's a bit young for that still. Uh, we'll leave that to, to Ben Prentor or Gary Player and, and, and Jack. Uh, now that sadly Arnold Palmer has, has departed. Oh, I, um, I wonder if he has a feeling that, it, will his son be caddying for him in the par three event, do you think, possibly? Or will it be the ooh, other way round? I hadn't thought of that, yes. Uh, yeah, well, for golfers who don't know, or for play, people who don't really play, uh, Augusta National obviously is, uh, is a unique place and it has a par three course. Mm. Uh, and the, there's, a, there's a, a par three tournament on the Wednesday prior uh, and it's traditional for uh, for, for the, some of the younger kids, at least, to, to caddy. Uh, and they all have a go, actually. The caddies have a go on the ninth hole, which is like a little island green over a, over a pond. I mean, it's a beautiful setting in a, in a valley just left of the tenth hole. Um, I, I think uh, I think Charlie's got his own game, actually, and, and he's probably more interested in that. But yeah. you never know. It would be a surprise, I must say. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I hadn't really thought of that. Yeah. T time goes so quickly, doesn't it, over the years that uh, looking back at some of the champions who aren't even teeing it up this time from Cabrera to obviously Faldo to Bernhard Langer's not playing this year. Sandy Lyle, of course, gave it a, a miss after last year. Marco Mira, uh, Gary Player, uh, Woosnam and others. It's a, you know, you remember these great champions uh, and now what we've got is a, a really a coming together of, I think, the next generation after Tiger Woods and, and it really coming to the fore. Not just one or two, there are others. And this, again, sadly, might well be one of the only times this season that we really see a true champion. Um, well, there's quite a few questions in there, actually. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> of course there uh, are. You're, you're right. <laughs> 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 um, but no, but so I, I could talk about the Masters for ages, and and uh, of course. Uh, but um, yes, as 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 past champions, they always get an invitation, mm. and for years and years and years, you'd see these old champions work their way around the course, uh, and and I. Sandy Lyle would nearly always make the cut, even up to you know yeah. the previous you know few years, um, and and Langer as well. They would and Fred Couples was another one. And you'd look on the leaderboard, and Tom Watson, uh, well he was still still turning up. Um, they'd all won it, uh, and they would all play amazingly well despite their age. And now I think the course has just become yeah. uh, too long for them. The equipment, which is another topic we could get onto. Yeah. Uh, the equipment sensible so far that uh, the older guys really haven't got a chance to compete. It's just too long for them. Uh, and then you can get situations uh, like one year Ben Crenshaw shot an 87, um, simply because most of the par fours were par fives for him uh, at the age of late 60s or whatever it was. So um, yeah, you're going to see more and more, um, more and more past champions not uh, not appearing. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Sandy Lyle actually because I, rem I remember like it was yesterday his his tournament mm -hmm. where he um, he had it in the bag yeah. then he put one in the water at the 12th had a bit of a wobble uh, and was behind and then birdied the last hole to win against Mark Alcabecchia and I couldn't help thinking uh, that was a lot like uh, the performance we saw yesterday from Lossie Wode uh at the augusta national uh, ladies championship it was all amateurs as the lady uh, championship uh, and it served up an absolute treat she um uh 
she had a two shot lead she was cruising along uh, uh, and then she three parted uh, to bogey the the par five which uh, the 13th and just at that time uh, Bailey Shoemaker was uh, was carding a 66 so she's like six holes ahead and she had a two shot lead and 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 Lottie's only got and Lottie's English she's got she yeah. can farm them um plays at uh, florida Florida, state university she's got a a golf scholarship which is a wonderful opportunity for her uh anyway um no problem birdied three of the last four holding 15 footers for par on 14. um obviously hit a tree and ended up miles back with a drive and uh and then she rammed in a birdie on the 15th uh nearly birdied 16 uh and uh and 17 and 18 she had 15 footers or so you know hold them dead center like nothing and so that was very similar. I couldn't help thinking of the similarities between that and Saint Uh and and this course nearly always throws up yeah. uh, amazing, amazing championships. And uh, you know those those are two cracking ones. And, yeah, I uh, mean, I'm glad you mentioned Lottie, and my wife Jane will absolutely be glad that you mentioned Lottie because she's been talking about her for the last 24 hours to me, making sure that we speak a little bit about Lottie. And you know what that does as well to the women's game over here for amateurs and those wanting to go to, as she has done like to, to florida state and and really become part and an important part that the, the great vivian sanderson and others used did 20 30 years ago now that, that, that there's a real take on you know playing really good golf and still having that dream like the boys of going all the way well i could never understand actually why girls weren't attracted to uh, to golf um when I was growing up, I was thinking, well, this is a great game for girls. I actually caddied on the ladies' tour uh, during my university vacations for uh, uh, for Maureen Medill, who was a, a former um, English amateur champion uh, from Northern Ireland, commentator now. Uh, and uh, they played so well, uh, and, and they were great to watch and, and far more relatable for, for, for guys. I mean, mm. they, 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 uh, for, for male amateurs to watch lady amateurs, uh, yeah. there's a fantastic thing. Uh, nowadays, I think the equipment has helped them hugely, and a little bit in the way perhaps that it helped tennis as well, mm -hmm. um, because they now play the courses, uh, the classic courses of, of you know McKenzie and Colt and, and the 1900s to 1935, the, the golden age courses. They play them now in a way that the architect intended, so that they can now show uh, their skills in a way that that the, the, the courses. The courses then produce a, a great tournaments. I mean, the stage is just as important as the uh, as the players, and that's I think one of the reasons why Augusta National throws up such great tournaments. Yeah. Yes, and, and people have got to see uh, you know how well girls play and how what a what a great advert they are, uh, and hopefully then that will inspire them to take up the game. And we we I saw you know golf at the Open in 1973 and decided I wanted to have a go. Nick Faldo, um, I understand watched Jack Nicklaus at the Masters, and that inspired him. <laughs> Uh, and we want these girls to have the same uh, the same exactly. role models uh, and the same opportunities. Plus, also, it's a, it's a great watch and it's different. Uh, and one of the things that I've, I've I've I love American football. And one of the things that I notice when you go to American football is that actually um, most American football fans love watching the college game uh, more than they love watching the NFL. And they say, I say, well, why is that? You say, well, they 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 take more risks uh, and they make more mistakes, and that actually makes it more interesting. And there's a little bit of that. Um, at the uh, at the Augusta mm. National yesterday, uh, you could see in a heartbeat how somebody could not do much wrong and take a double with yeah. no problem at all, and and the slopes that, that just eke balls away, and and, and the, the, the the fine margins for error, and the quick grains and the impossible chips that you can get if you get the wrong side of the hole, they were all highlighted mm. beautifully yesterday. I thought we're uh, the, the Augusta uh, Masters as well has this extraordinary tradition as it does and. Um, all of these past uh, winners are able to go to the dinner the night before. It's John Rahm's occasion to choose the menu as defending champion. I wonder. Yes, well, he's um, he's got quite a bit of publicity for it. I think yeah. uh, um, I think he's done quite well. He's gone the, the full Spanish experience, and uh, and good luck to him. I hope he hasn't made it too spicy, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> he can do what he likes, can't he? He's the master's champion. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> He's got to make a speech, though. That's the, that's maybe one of the things that uh, that yeah. will be making him a little just, bit. Uh, just wonder if he slipped a few padron peppers in for a start of oh, exactly. the, the really spicy ones <laughs> <laughs> that you you always just try to find one. But, but you, anyway, um, yeah, but it must be a great thing. It's hosted by Ben Crenshaw, yeah. um, who's obviously a great master's champion and a very knowledgeable golf historian as yeah. well. 
um but uh, obviously uh, you know it's a very private event yeah, and uh, a very, very elite uh, group of people so we'll <laughs> never know really but uh, yes we can see the menu um just looking at, at some of the other englishmen tommy fleetwood's been very consistent and matt fitzpatrick has found his former again in the last few weeks yes very determined uh and uh, I, lo I look to um players who showing a bit of form uh, and who the, the course suits and Matt, Matt Fitzpatrick um, got an invite to Augusta as an amateur and made the cut uh, and it was always played pretty well there uh, and I think if you're going if you're looking for somebody to uh, to back if you if you're a betting person or if you just want to predict who will who will do well uh, I think people who've done well there in the past I mean the course suits certain types of player mm. uh, and he is uh, he's definitely one of them uh, he's so rigorous in his uh, in his preparation, he's got a great caddy, Billy Foster, as well, um, and you know they're a great team. And they and and the thing is, he's done it now. He knows that he can be a major champion, uh, and he's in form. So those are the kinds of guys that I look for. I also mm -hmm. think, um, you know, the, the the top of the play, players' championship leaderboard was a good guy. I thought uh, Wyndham Clark again is a similar kind of thing. Uh, won the U.S. Open last year. Um, been working with a mental coach, not afraid of it, and had a real good run at the uh, the players as well. Um, and I'm, can, yeah, I throw uh, in, can, can I throw in? Can I throw in? Just because I feel that he's beginning to talk again to himself in the right way. That Jordan Spieth, I think, might have a good week. Well, it's a it's a course that suits Jordan Spieth very well. I mean, he's a brilliant chipper and uh, and pitcher. Uh, and pretty good putter, and he's he's not the greatest driver. He, I mean, he, no. he, he, when he won it, uh, he shot 66, I think, in the third round, and he was bouncing in off trees, and, and I wouldn't call it lucky, but uh, because Augusta gives you a chance to play, it has no rough underneath the trees, uh, has either pine straw or, mm. or, or a second cut. Now, when it was first built, I mean, Mackenzie insisted that they had just a single cut. There was no rough at all. And if you read Mackenzie's book, um, so I question about Jordan Spieth. I've got on to Alice and McKenzie no, now. There's a purpose to this because like it allows people to recover yeah. uh, if they're good enough. And Spieth is really good enough. He um, yeah. hasn't won a major for a while, but he's certainly got the pedigree. Uh, and again, he's on the leaderboard in Texas this this week. So um, yes, you know that you know that he'll be trying. I, and I like former champions yeah. uh, as, a, as, a, as a prediction. I think they always do well. Like the Sandy Lyle thing, they 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 work their way around the course. They understand it. The other one. Uh, who's done well uh, is uh, this recently is Hideki Matsuyama. He won in Los Angeles at the Genesis uh, Riviera, which is an old style golf course, and he's playing really well this week as well. So, I, and he's a former champion. He won it, uh, won it in 2021. I tell, I tell you, I've been so, watching a bit of him this week, and it looks great. His, yeah. When he's got himself out of position, his control from the bunkers has been extraordinary. Yes. Yes, it's been a great short game week for him this week. Sort and, of thing uh, you might need when you get to the 15th and things like that, or the 13th and, <laughs> and, and others. If you well, maybe even before then. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> um, but whatever. Look, um, you've you've whetted the appetite, Jeremy, and look forward to um, speaking to you next week when it'll be still really on and in there with uh, exactly yes. what's happening. Great stuff as always from Jeremy Dale, uh, Tony Jardine. Bit of Formula One to finish the Sunday Night Club on Talk TV tonight. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. Said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to... <laughs> Yeah. For... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, let's speak to Tony Jardine of the Japanese Grand Prix. Uh, Tony, good evening. Mark, how are you? Yeah, very well. No bull today, then. <laughs> <laughs> they were back on it. Yeah, it was business as usual, um, <laughs> sadly. Um, but but there were there were some great things happening behind. Yeah. As usual, the cameras didn't bother about uh, Verstappen. Um, Perez was coming back through the field after his various pit stops. And it was all going on. I was quite excited about it, but I was encouraged by Ferrari's performance. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? Because you know uh, more than most of us by any means with your great experience that what they did the week before and what they've done now and everything means that the, for Ferrari, this is important, that they've got their cars going forward, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. I was just looking down the list of the Grand Prix to come and wondering where they might have the edge again, um, as they did. And, and circuits where it's less aerodynamic, they've certainly got a chance. Miami's coming up, Monte Carlo's mm. coming up. And as the season progresses, a team like Ferrari with such, such a massive budget, they will be having upgrades arriving all the time. But the encouraging thing for me is that on a, on a circuit that's so abrasive and so aerodynamic like Suzuka, mm. where the perfect aero setup and, and the Red Bull is so kind to its tyres, so this time was the Ferrari. So you've got two different strategies. Leclerc going on, you know, this, this one stopper and going on the harder tyres and trying to stay out there and doing a really good job. And then Sainz coming through. Uh, as conditions vary. But I, I just was really encouraged by that whole thing. Um, and, and I think I was disappointed by McLaren at the same time because mm -hmm. they've been going so well and from third on the grid to drop down as Lando Norris did disappointingly. Um, 
was a little bit of a problem, but it just shows you that this was all about time management. It was all about strategy. And yet, despite that, we had some great overtaking maneuvers. I mean, Russell's uh, maneuver as, as he went past, you know, on the, on the last lap of Piastri, that was, that was absolutely fantastic. And Yuki Tsunoda, I know he's the Japanese hero, but that kid was passing around the outside where it shouldn't ought to happen. Mm. You know, through the S's and where you're getting these incredible G-forces and where, of course, on the first lap, there was the big crash with Ricciardo um, and Alex Albon. Uh, fortunately, they were both okay, but that was a big smash. Do you get a sense as well, and I, I sort of get this uh, in some way, that look, I know that Hamilton has already decided about his future and others here, but there's there's some young exciting talent now as as we begin to see more drivers come through perhaps slightly more mature at times than some of the others at that young age incredible because they start younger because they're weaned right through karting from when they're seven eight years of age because big manufacturers have got have built these academies like ferrari and you saw Oliver Behrman, you know, stepping into the car in Saudi Arabia in place of science with his appendix, appendicitis operation and finishing seventh place overall. Now, mm. he's sitting there and what's going to happen probably next year if there isn't a, a drive at Ferrari for him, which there isn't going to be, they'll stick him in the house, which is a Ferrari engine team. You know, Mercedes are probably going to have to take a chance on a young driver. And it was interesting. There was one shot at the end. Ricciardo was standing there pondering the monitors, knowing that his job is on the line and that, you know, he's made this, he's been given this comeback chance. He's been absolutely smashed by young uh, Yuki Tsunoda, the Japanese driver so far. And Liam Lawson, the young U New Zealander, was sitting, standing just behind him, uh, watching the same screen. That kid should be in a regular drive yeah he substituted last year and got points and he substituted for ricciardo when when he broke his wrist at sample yeah no, so that... there's about four or five of them honestly in the wings mark who could step into the car and do a good job yeah no look, I, I completely agree uh, w with you on that where next are we oh, we're going to china and we yeah. haven't been to china for five years it, it's one heck of a track um it's it's basically it's got all these concentric rings where where corners go inside themselves it's so wide you've got so many different lines you could take you can get five cars abreast it's it's amazing um but i, I think again it's all going to be down to to the weather the tires on that particular mm -hmm. tarmac what tires they choose on on the friday and so on so all those parameters they're going to have to manage but I think these days it becomes so scientific, far more than than perhaps in in my day we were going out and doing a bit of that. And all the tires are blistering. We better change the suspension around a bit. It's so it's, everything is so aerodynamic now, especially with new regulations. But it's good to have China back yeah. after five years. But again, as we discussed at the beginning of the year, we've got twenty four races. Okay. And, and we've only just started. We've just scratched the surface. And I, I do still worry about fatigue for the crews. I do still worry um, about people getting tired and, and making mistakes in pit stops or not doing up the final lunch. You saw what happened actually in, in Australia to Verstappen. And that brake problem was what was done by the technicians and what wasn't done properly. And as Verstappen said in Australia, it was like driving the handbrake on. So by lap three, the whole left rear brake mm. was on fire. And that was that was a mistake. You can imagine when you get these triple races together and they end up in Las Vegas off and all those different tires, uh, time zones. Gosh, I hope they don't make some serious errors. No, I, I agree with you. And, and that's where I think the young men now who've come into this uh, arena uh, with perhaps what they've done with the virtual side of this uh, great stuff as well when you think of certain training away from the track and other things that they've done i i sense the next generation are going to be a very exciting competitive bunch yeah 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 because because the talent goes right the way through from from the engineering to the aerodynamicists mm. to the organizers to the logistics people 
And when I go down pit lanes these days, I look at, at, at the, how young they are, you know, in these different jobs. And you go, well, but they, as you say, they're vibrant, they're talented, they are the future. It's absolutely fabulous to see. And of course, Formula One is, is growing on a global scale since the Americans took it over because it was being held back by Bernie Eccleston. There's, there's no question or doubt about that. He micromanaged everything. He was a one man band and he was brilliant. He, he got it to where it was, but the Americans have taken it much, mm -hmm. much further uh, nice. than anyone before. And of course that gives, it gives scope to these youngsters um, to expand uh, and, and to fulfill their careers. Brilliant. Tony, uh, great. And we look forward to China. And thank you very much indeed, as always, Tony Jardine, with his expertise after uh, a one-two back where we were with Red Bull before last week's Grand Prix. Still a long way to go. Howard Hughes. Mark, how are you? Long time no talk. Listen, I, I know time is short, but it's nice to hear your voice. You know, look, it's always great to talk to you. Can you tell me why um, every time I now walk my, my new little dog, Landy, when we get into, uh, we walk through the churchyard, let's say, and everything, she gets quite excited and agitated at times. Well, if you've seen videos of dogs who actually stay around the graves of their former owners, ah. I think dogs are more sensitive than yeah. you know, either of us, I think. That's you know, really mind you, they would, in my case, they wouldn't have to try very hard, but there we are. <laughs> Come on, what are you going to do? Tonight, uh, the chant from the, from the cop end is Why Are We Waiting? And that's all to do with UAP news. No disclosure. How come? We'll talk about that tonight. Um, we'll talk about Havana Syndrome. We'll talk about a new um, AI safety deal between us and the Americans. We'll ask if Elvis is haunting a casino. Uh, we'll be crossing to Hollywood to do that. A bit of NDE news for you. Uh, a 3D map of the universe.